almost forgot. Almost, not quite. Go ahead and call this evening's meeting to order. Um, Chamber of School District Committee, the whole meeting for April 9th. Uh, please rise for Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, prior to our meeting this evening, we had an executive session, uh, full executive session, uh, a lot of good discussion for multiple items, personnel matters, legal matters, and the uh, JROTC uh, co-op um, programs. Um, so with that, item 3.01, superintendent's report, Mr. Bigger. Thanks, Mr. Norcross. Um, I've enjoyed the last couple weeks on the State of the District presentations to as many staff members who will listen to me. Um, so we call that a faculty meeting, um, and it's been wonderful to go out to each building and do that. I'm a little over halfway through, and I've really enjoyed the engagement between the staff and the State of District report. Um, so what happens after that faculty meeting is we do send a survey to them and say, okay, moving forward, What's most important to you for us to uh, look at in the district as we progress forward for a blueprint and, and action? So we're getting those survey results by each faculty. Um, after that's complete, I'll send that out to the community. The community will do the same thing, saying, hey, what's most important for us to address in the district? So then we'll have this state of the district, we'll have the staff prioritization, and we'll have the community prioritization, which will give us some direction on how we're moving our Chambersburg blueprint uh, for the future forward. So I'm excited about that process. It's time consuming, but I'm learning a lot um, about Chambersburg and some things that you wouldn't get just from a phone call or an email. So that face-to-face -face is certainly making a difference. Um, it is PSSA Keystone testing season is here and it's the race to the end of the school year. Um, for those who know, as it gets warmer out there, there's an incentive to maybe not come to school. Please parents help us Make sure you finish strong, get your kids in school. This last uh, marking period is really critical for certainly passing, performance, college entrance, exams, all that. So um, please finish strong. Um, last note and last item is if you haven't registered for kindergarten for next year, please do so. The sooner we get folks enrolled, the sooner we know um, how many teachers we're gonna need and what buildings they're gonna be at. So please enroll kindergarten if you haven't and you can do that certainly right out here in the front lobby. That concludes my report at this time. Thank you, Mr. Bigger. Uh, 3.02 President's Report. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank my, uh, my esteemed colleague here for uh, holding down the fort last meeting. Um, as you might be able to tell, I may or may not have been in a sunny place, uh, but uh, it's also good to be back home. Uh, but I enjoyed the sun also. Um, it's time of year for the school board. Uh, as Chris mentioned with, just mentioned with uh, PSSAs and students and teachers, uh, as school board, um, you know, now we're getting into the budget crunch um, time. It's gonna get busy. We're gonna have a presentation today from Crab, tonight from Crabtree Roarball. Uh, the term I've used in the past is the heavy lift with, with facilities and, and academics. Uh, programming and how we marry the two together and then plus as you, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, our executive session tonight uh, you know an hour was not near enough so we still have a lot of items to do there uh, we have a lot of a lot of work ahead of us to do so uh, be patient with us and we'll be patient with each other and and we will get through it but uh, it's a busy time of year especially till we get through the budget and, and several of these uh, personnel matters. Um, item 3.03, .03, presentations. So we have our ELL presentation is first. 
So Andrea Mills, our ESL supervisor, and some of the staff are here to report on their uh, visits to other places on how they do uh, EL programming for the district. So prior to allocating resources, we're researching best practices and ideas for English learner programming. And I do want to thank them for all of their time and visits and analysis. This is like presentation number nine, I think, Andrea, so I'm sorry to put you through that. But I think they're well prepared for tonight. Just making sure this is on. Hi, I'm Andrea Mills. I'm the K-12 ESL supervisor for the district. Um, and tonight, uh, we will just be talking about some data from the ESL program, as well as just an overview of some of the program visits that we conducted. But before we get to that, I'd like to introduce um, two ESL teachers that we have with us tonight that will be presenting about the program visits as well. This is Letitia Burley and Caitlin Michael. And I would also like to take a moment for the other ESL teachers that have joined us tonight, if they could just stand for a moment. And I just wanted to say thank you for, first of all, coming tonight voluntarily, <laughs> taking the time out of your evening to support uh, the ESL program, support me. And I just wanted to say thank you for all that you do for our students every day. So thanks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so English as a second language, otherwise known as ESL, and I'll be referring to the program as ESL throughout the presentation. And as far as uh, referencing English learner students, I will be using the term L or acronym L. Just giving some fast facts about the program. So as of the end of March, we have 1,414 ESL students in the district. We have increased in our L population by 170% in the last 10 years. About 15% of our special ed students are also L students. And what we do to measure the English language development is by using the world-class instructional design and assessment, otherwise known as the WIDA assessment. The students take that every January or February, and we get the results at the end of May. The students can achieve either a level one, two, three, or four before they exit. And to get an exiting score, they would need a 4.5 along with some other teacher feedback. Just explaining what some of those levels mean, a level one would be a student that has limited to no English language. Those students may not know how to use uh, basic vocabulary, asking to go to the restroom, et cetera. Level two students are students that have some conversational English. They're able to interact with peers, but really struggle with that academic vocabulary. Level three students are students that are more proficient socially, but still, again, struggle with that academic language. And a level four student, they are close to proficiency. They may struggle a little bit with academic language, but again, they are closer to proficiency like their reg ed peers. An L student, needs at least one ESL course in their schedule until they exit. Some students need more depending on the level of need. And it takes an L student about six years to exit from services. Some students take longer, some students take less time. This is a snapshot of the L population growth over the last 10 years. Um, Taking a look, our total currently 1,414 students, but if you look back at just October of this school year, we had 1,012, uh, 1,286 students. And then if you look back to October of 2013, we had 523 students. So that just shows you the level of growth that we've had. It's been pretty steady, but in the past five years, we've had a tremendous amount of growth, especially this school year. Um, this school year, since 
July, we have gained 319 ESL students. So this is our largest year of growth so far, and the year is not over yet, folks. <laughs> Next slide, please. So next, we are going to talk about the program visits that we had conducted. Um, I took multiple ESL teachers with me on these visits to see what other school districts are doing, what programs they offer. I've done a lot of research on the effectiveness on various methods as well, just to get an idea of what programs would be best for Chambersburg. Next slide. Comparing the populations and staffing, you can see the percentages of the English learners compared to the total student body for our district compared to the schools that we visited. So first, um, our school district has 15% of our total student body population are L's. Washington County, Maryland f uh, has 5% of their population as L's. Bethlehem, 9%, and Allentown, 23%. As far as staffing, elementary ESL teachers, we have 15. Washington County has 30. Bethlehem, 25. And Allentown has 40. Secondary ESL teachers, we have 11 and a half. One teacher is half interpreter, half teacher. Washington County has 27, Bethlehem 25, and Allentown has 32. Next slide, please. The first program that we're going to discuss tonight is the Washington County co-teaching model. Uh, co-teaching is a method where there's a regular ed content teacher in the classroom as well as an ESL teacher in the classroom. It could look like a variety of different ways depending on how the teachers are teaching that lesson for the day, but one method could look like both teachers in the front of the room as we had seen in Washington County and one teacher is giving most of the content the ESL teacher would be circling vocabulary, underlining different phrases, drawing pictures on the board as they are going through the lesson, posing questions as the lesson occurs, maybe even directly asking questions to ESL students as the lesson goes on. Another method would be the one teacher speaking in the front, giving a majority of the content, and the other ESL teacher could be in the back, pulling a small group. So there are a variety of different ways that this could work in a classroom, depending on the lesson that the, the teachers are teaching for that day. But at Washington County, the ESL teachers are co-teaching at all levels, so at elementary, middle, and high school and all content areas are eligible for co-teaching. So they could be co-teaching in science, math, social studies, English, or electives, depending on what the need is. They also have direct English language development instruction that's provided at the middle and high school levels currently. That means that they, these students have separate classes that focus specifically on their English language development. So looking specifically at vocabulary, uh, maybe looking at letter recognition, depending on what the needs of the students are and what level of education they're coming to the school with. They are looking at expanding this into the elementary level. Some advantages to this program, the students are fully immersed with their native English speaking peers. The ESL teachers are consistently in the loop of their L students' progress in classes because they are there with them in the classes, helping them with activities on a daily basis, seeing where their struggles are in specific content areas. Any content can be provided with support. 
And then this also helped immensely with attendance issues at the secondary level. They spoke very highly of this component. They just implemented co-teaching this school year, and they noticed a great increase in their attendance at the secondary level. Some disadvantages. There was a lack of direct instruction at the elementary level. They noted this. They said that was an area that they would be working on for next year with additional staffing to be able to provide that support. Success is also highly dependent with co-teaching on teacher personalities and collaboration efforts, proper professional development and training, and the follow through from administrators just to make sure that everyone is doing their part. Next slide, please. Washington County also had an International Welcome Center. This was a central location for pre-enrollment paperwork that was located at their Pangborn Elementary School. And the paperwork was completed with bilingual staff. So sometimes when parents register online, we sometimes don't always get the correct information because they do not always understand what the registration paperwork is asking. So this helps that process and being able to collect that correct information right in their first sit down with staff from the school. It helps to take some of the following off of the ESL uh, teachers' plates. So right now, all of our ESL teachers are screening students, um, which means that they are giving a, an abbreviated version of the WIDA assessment to assess their language development right when they enter our school to get an idea of how much English they know. Most of our students come in at a level one. But this takes sometimes a couple hours, depending on the student's knowledge, um, to assess the students with screening. It also helps with obtaining transcripts or confirming L status of previous schools. When students are coming to us from school districts um, in certain states that we may have trouble getting transcripts from or other countries, it can be quite difficult to obtain the, that information and some of that's critical for the students to be able to, especially at the secondary level, graduate on time and for us to understand their educational background. And that can sometimes take quite a bit of time, depending on the student and the location that this information is coming from. It helps to connect families to community resources, so their staff and liaisons help to connect those families with different resources. And this International Welcome Center is not just for ESL students, families. This is for any family that needs this service. They also help to host family nights to engage the parents in the school district as well as to connect, continue that connection with community resources. All right, next slide, please. We're gonna talk about Bethlehem next and I'm gonna pass this over to Letitia. So I had the opportunity to visit Bethlehem School District, and they are larger in population, but we have a larger ESL percentage. And they do things very similarly to what we do here. Um, they kind of have an expanded leveled instruction, though. Um, I'm elementary, so I'm much more familiar with that. But um, their elementary schools have a direct pullout instruction program, and that's what the majority of us do here. Um, they pull their kids out, give them instruction, and they do that by levels based upon the WIDA score results. And um, so that would be wonderful. They have enough staff to do that. Um, at the middle school level, they do the ELD courses and they also do the leveled English courses. And at the high school level, they do sheltered instruction and ELD. And 
They also have the school to work program for the high school. So we had an opportunity to visit those students as well. And we learned that a lot of them can grow up to two levels by participating in that program. They also have what they called a curriculum connection, which is where they had both um, learning support staff and ESL teachers work together to provide like a help period for those students or teachers who need some assistance. For students, it could be um, something with their schoolwork. For the teachers, it could be working with them on how to grade students, especially newcomers when they come in, when there's such a discrepancy in what all of the other students are able to do versus what a level one or two student is able to do. It can be very hard for the teachers to figure out how to grade them appropriately. So the Curriculum Connection provided that support for, for both teachers and students. And they also had time for case management, which is where these students um, each had like each student had somebody who was responsible for following them to make sure that they were getting the appropriate classes that they needed to make sure that they graduated on time and to get them the things that they needed to be prepared. Um, some advantages were that the students were scheduled by WIDA level, and so you had students of similar levels together. So you didn't have those newcomers who were still learning how to figure out where things are and how to navigate the building with students who were close to being exited and needed more focus on a push with writing and a push with academics as opposed to just learning basics. Um, they also used the PDE formula to determine where students were and whether they were like on track to exit. As Andrea mentioned, it takes about six years for most students to exit. So by using the PDE formula, they are able to see if those kids are on track or if maybe they need some extra intervention or maybe this kid's doing really well and maybe they can exit sooner and so maybe they needed different types of classes, but using that helped them to determine if they were on track or not. And they also had a program that connected with their um, learning management, student management system yes. um, that helped the faculty to quickly pull data and be able to plug it into the formula and figure that out. Some disadvantages is that at the high school level, um, there was more sheltering. Um, so maybe some of those kids should be pushed out a little sooner. So they, they do more sheltering than we do here. Um, they also need more exposure to grade level content. And being in that sheltered program may not permit that to happen as quickly as we would like to see that. I'm Caitlin Michael, and I teach uh, one of the newcomer courses in middle school. I'm at CAMS North. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I was part of the team that went to visit the Allentown Newcomer Academies. Uh, we were visiting the elementary building on our visit. And in Allentown, they have two separate buildings for their newcomers. So their first grade through sixth grade, we're in one building and across town they had seventh through 12th grade in another building. Um, and the way that this was structured is that um, students would be in the program for a year at max. Um, some students, if they progressed really well, they had the opportunity to be transitioned back to their home school partway through the year. Um, and there would be a group of students and it would be um, talked about between the counselor, the teachers, the principal, and the parents, and they would make that decision together if students were ready to transition back to their home school. Um, and so, I missed a check mark on there. Um, in the newcomer academies and the high school, especially, there are only a few electives that are being able to that are offered to the students um, because it's a smaller. Um, building, they don't have the ability to have 
all of the um, electives. I think right now they were offering soccer as like a gym class maybe, and they had art um, as their high school electives. And then um, I'm gonna jump down to one of the disadvantages and kind of go along with that and say that um, uh, the lack of credits at the high school level, not all the classes were eligible for high school credit, so students were taking the classes, but they still would have to take more credits once they transition back to their home high school building. Um, another thing that we noticed at the academies were there were a lot of bilingual staff. Um, the majority of the staff were bilingual. Um, almost everyone, I'm not sure, was the principal bilingual? She was, okay. So everyone we encountered was bilingual, um, either English and Spanish or English and Arabic because their population, higher population is um, Arabic speakers. And um, because they had separate buildings for these students, they also had staff like nurses, counselors, and learning support. So they had one nurse, I believe, um, one counselor and a learning support teacher and those staff were went between two buildings. So sometimes they would start their day in one building and then end their day in another and go back and forth. Um, so they would share their resources that way. Um, and one of the advantages to having a newcomer academy is it does create a soft landing for students when they're coming to a new school in the US. Um, it's a big change. They're coming from another country, another language. Uh, school looks different, so it creates a space for them to um, get acclimated to what it's like in the United States and in school here. Um, they also have found that there's a higher parent engagement um, with their students that attend the newcomer academies than their newcomers that are not able to attend the newcomer academy or choose not to um, for space reasons. Sometimes they don't have space for all their newcomers to attend, so they stay back at their home buildings. Um, but they have found that there's a higher parent engagement um, with those parents. And instead of being leveled by WIDA, because all of these students are level ones, um, they're able to have them leveled by grade, and then they're teaching them um, according to their WIDA level, but also giving them the grade level um, content um, adapted for them. Some of the dis disadvantages to this model was that it creates a lot of transitions for students. You see them coming into the United States, that's one transition. Coming to a new school, that's another transition. Learning a new language, that's another transition. Oh, and now that you're at this school, you're only here for a year, and now you're going to another school, that's another transition. Um, so for us, we were just counting all those transitions, and it seemed like a lot. Um, it's a high cost to do this. They have two separate buildings for these um, academies, and students start their, they get bused to their home school, and then from their home school, they get bused to their academy, and then at the end of the day, they get bused back to their home school, and then get bused home. Unless they live close to the academy, then they can walk. Um, so it was a lot of transportation cost, additional building costs, um, staff in addition to ESL teachers, um, and yes. And then also we were seeing that it seemed like there was a lack of an immersion in with English for these students because they were with all level one English speakers. They were with other people that spoke Spanish, Arabic, Creole, and I can't remember the other languages they had, but you didn't have native English speakers other than teachers that were there um, that they could be learning that important um, English from. And like I said before, they had a lack of credits at the high school level. So that was our trip to Newcomer Academy. Next slide, please. So moving forward, um, Mr. Bigger gave his presentation last month and we're examining the educational design for future programming of ESL in the district. And some things that we're prioritizing are in-classroom supports, as well as a parent and welcome center for um, parents and students, which would 
deal with the screening and ease of re registration, as well as connecting the families um, with the community resources. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Can you run me through just a typical, let's say you have someone that comes in level one, fourth grade, or whatever grade, how do you get them as soon as they come in the building, do the assessment, like what does that look for them, are they put in a school and then they are in with everybody that speaks English, I I'm just curious just for mine, because yeah. I know how these other places do it, how we're doing it here, and how that differs from what you guys saw. Yeah, it does differ at each level. Okay. But as far as elementary, fourth grade, I'm gonna pass it to Letitia because she experiences this every day. Okay. <laughs> well, I know bigger buildings are not quite as easy, but for the smaller buildings, I can. I usually take my planning time to go assess the student, um, provided that it's not their lunch time or not, you know, something that I can't pull them from. But when they come in, um, I would love to say I welcome them to the building, but I am not in my home building first thing in the morning because I'm at two buildings. So um, usually somebody comes in, sees that they get to wherever classroom they need to go to. They get kind of thrown into whatever is going on. And as I have the opportunity, I pull them for testing and then determine if they need services. If it's a level one student, you're pretty much gonna guarantee they're gonna need services, but we still have to do the testing to determine exactly where they are and then put them into services. I usually try to start pulling them that day or as soon as I have the results from the testing, I start pulling them into the group and start working with them to get them as much language as I can. And if they're a level one student at the elementary, they get a program called Grapeseed, so we get that implemented and get that information home. Hopefully they have a way, a device or something that they can use at home so that they can use that program both at home and in the building with us as the teacher teaching the content to them and as classroom teachers, they have the opportunity as the kids are rotating through different activities during the day, they can also put the students on that program to get the repetition to help them to learn and acquire the language as quickly as possible. Okay. Oh, I have a follow-up. Sorry, Mike. Hold on. Go for it. So what, how does that differ at the secondary level then? At the secondary level, um, do you want to speak to middle school or do you want me to? Okay. So Caitlin's going to talk about middle school. I can talk about high school because okay. they both look a little bit different. Okay. This is my every day. <laughs> um, so at the middle school, when we are told that there's a newcomer coming or someone that's coming from out of the country, we automatically assume they're probably newcomer until we're able to talk with them um, and determine otherwise. So um, the counselor lets me know. I give the counselor a name of a student that's bilingual in that language to help a company on the tour of the building. Um, and then they're brought to my classroom. I am the homeroom for all the newcomer students um, at CAMS North. So 6th, 7th, and 8th are all together, start their day in my room. Um, there's 20 of them. Um, and they then, are, I go over their schedule with them. They've gone on a tour already to know what their schedule is. And we have a window of time. It's, I think, 10 days maybe five, we usually get it done by five, um, that we have to screen students um, from like when they've been enrolled or started, stepped foot in our schools. So it's very rare that we're able to screen at the middle school level on their first day in our school. Also, it's a big place and it's overwhelming and we don't always want to screen them on their first day because it's just a lot. Um, so within the first couple of days, they get screened. Um, CAMS North, we have an assistant, um, so she's able to screen them. CAMS South does not, so the teachers have to find time in their schedule um, and help each other out um, to screen the students. Then they have their English class with me, and the rest of the classes they're out with their regular ed peers. Um, our assistant is able to go to some of the classes, but not all of them to help with that transition in the classes. Um, and they have 
an additional support period with me every other day. So some students will see me three times a day, one day, and then the next day they might only see me twice that day because the um, support is every other day. And at the high school level, one of our teachers, uh, Scott Methner, he's half interpreter, half teacher, and the students will start their day with him. He will provide them with their Chromebook. He helps to do their orientation at the high school because that's an even bigger building. <laughs> and um, he screens them on day one and then takes them along with their belongings over to the counselors, helps to create a schedule because with the amount of electives and variety of classes at uh, the high school and depending on their level, it could be quite a complicated schedule to try to maneuver, so he assists with that as well. And he also has a, a, a good idea of how many students are in each class, et cetera. So once that's completed, they usually pair that student, if they're able to, with someone that can help to show them to their classes for the rest of the day. And um, typically, if it's a level one student, they are in sheltered classes. So they are at, um, they are with ESL teachers for a majority of their day, but they do have some interaction throughout the day with <laughs> native English speaking peers. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Question regarding the uh, welcome centers uh, that you spoke of. Are they open every day or just one day a mm -hmm. week or what's the, the schedule? The International Welcome Center at Washington County is open every day of during the week. And they're open the same time as school is open. Okay, you, you referred to the fact that they did more than the English language student interaction that they did community types of things. Yes. So is is that hosted by somebody other than the school district or? Those employees would also assist with that. So they might stagger their schedules or adapt their schedules for that additional time in the evening. And they also partner with uh, community partnerships to help with those events. So it's not just them putting on the event all by themselves. Okay. And the other question that I had had to do with your advantages and disadvantages. Were those advantages and disadvantages things that the schools that you visited recognized, or are they things that you assumed were advantages or disadvantages from your observations? Some of the advantages and disadvantages were some of the things that they noticed, but others were items that we also noted as an outsider looking in at the programs as well as um, thinking about our research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. So one of the charts caught my attention, and that was the one where it showed the numbers of students over the four districts and the numbers of teachers. And it looked like Chambersburg was very, very, I'll say woefully inadequate in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, were, has this number remained the same over like these many, many years, or was there a larger number that somehow were eliminated? So how do we get to this position today? Do you know that? Well, I do have some information right. on that, so give me one moment to get to that section. Um, so we have somewhat steadily increased our staff. Um, this, let's see here, at the secondary level, we've kind of held consistent for the past two years. Um, in 21, 22, we had 11 staff members, 20 to 21, nine, 19 to 20, 10. So some teachers had to shift around occasionally. 18 to 19, we had six and a half at the secondary level, so there was a little bit of a jump there. For the elementary level, uh, for the past few years, we've, we've held the same number. For a while, we had um, a little under 14 staff members for 20 to 21, 19 to 20. 18 to 19, we had 12. So we haven't increased our staff by a lot in the last I would say five years or so, um, 
there was a time where we had a few larger jumps, but we have not significantly increased our staff in a while. And part of that, I think, uh, was partially due. I'm, I'm stepping fresh into the ESL supervisor role, and that hasn't been uh, covered by a, a single individual since pre-COVID. Someone had absorbed that role for a while amongst their many other hats. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, question I have. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your work. Uh, we appreciate it, and you're serving a ton of students, so um, it's really crucial. Uh, yeah, my question is, of the three schools that you visited, which school was doing the stuff that you were most energized by in terms of, like, wow, that's, that's creative, or that's a way we hadn't thought about things before, and if we were to do that, we think there'd be significant educational benefit, mm -hmm. as well as other things beyond education, just the well-being of the students, that type of thing. Absolutely. Um, whenever we debriefed um, in the smaller groups, as well as with the whole ESL staff, we actually said that one model doesn't fit us the best. We think a hybrid of some of these models would be the most beneficial. So taking some of the best pieces that we noticed and putting them together for Chambersburg <clears throat> would at least be what we feel is most beneficial for us. I did have one comment. Um, you were taking at the junior high level, I guess, other students who s spoke that language and helping out. I'm, I'm suspecting at the elementary level that would probably be a little, a little harder to, to, to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. If they were in the same grade level, we could do that, but uh, it's a little more difficult yeah. across grade levels. Yeah. And we often do, sorry, we often do do that if we have kids who come in that are in the same grade level, same class. They often get paired up like that, mm -hmm. but they're pretty much together anyway, so they kind of migrate towards each other and find each other pretty quickly anyway. Yeah. Did I hear you correctly that it's 319 EL students that just came, came to our district just this school year? That correct? is correct. And the year is not over yet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've had a large jump this year compared to the trends. Um, we've been trending 100, 150 students per year for the last five years. And this year was um, a much larger jump that we did not anticipate. Is, is there any research on the impact to the native English speaking students with the um, newcomers being in the classroom with the teacher who has both native English speaking students and these totally unfamiliar with English? Well, I will be honest, there's not as much research as what you would think, since this is a growing issue um, in the United States. But when looking at different program models, bilingual education is actually the top, um, the best method proven, and co-teaching is number two. Best for whom? Best for the students and for attaining the students their English that language. Are coming in, I'm speaking of the native English language student the impact and also the teacher, the impact of having those two widely disparate um, groups of students. There's not any research that I have found on that since they're still conducting research on the most effective method of educating ESL students. But um, we have differentiation in all of our classrooms and we see a variety of leveled students throughout the day. Uh, when I taught seventh grade, I had a student that did not know how to spell the word the, right? So we have a variety of needs already within the classroom, so the same could be probably posed for special education in the reg ed classrooms as well. But I don't know that there is necessarily any firm research that shows the impact on regular education students with a variety of needs in their classrooms.
Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. When we get to the budget, you'll see some allocation of resources um, on this topic in our budget presentation. The concern that I always have, and I've spoken about it before, you know, within the classroom, we have uh, with 319 kids coming in that need services in English. We've got kids that are sitting in those classrooms that need reading intervention, math intervention. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we'll fall into the budget on how many can we provide and knowing that we, we need extra help to get mm -hmm. those kids reading by third grade. It's a massive undertaking for any classroom teacher to have the, the varied skill level and the needs of, of the students. It's becoming increasingly more difficult to, to meet the needs of all the students in those classrooms. And I know what you're saying for the, for the child that's sitting there that's an English speaker, you know, the teacher has to gauge her time, whether she's working with the EL student, with special ed student, or, or regular ed. And it's, it's very, it's very, it becomes very complicated. And, and I already know we need more intervention in the school district. So with, with budgets, it's gonna be a really hard call on what, what we do as far as meeting all the needs of the very kids in these classrooms. And we need to really applaud the teachers because sometimes I, I wonder how can they meet the needs of all those kids, especially when non-English speakers uh, arrive in their classroom and it's very, very difficult. So we applaud the teachers. Absolutely, and as Absolutely. a matter of fact, Everybody. my concern about English learners was what prompted me to run for school board, but I also see the frustration of the teacher um, trying to balance that. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Uh, every student, every student gets, should have what they need, every student, but it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to do. Well, and if you look at the numbers, which I did while she was doing her presentation, so Washington County Public School has 19 students for every teacher, and Bethlehem has 24 for every teacher, Allentown has 54 students for every teacher, Chambersburg has 53 ESL students for one teacher, if you would break it down just by the numbers. That's, if you're looking at it like that, and I know sometimes it's apples and oranges, but to me personally, that number that she's talking about, what did you say, 319? Yes. Let's be clear, that is only going to increase. We're seeing it all the time. Not just Chambersburg, Shippensburg has had a huge influx of English as a second language. Greencastle has doubled their English as a second language just this school year. Yeah. So it is he, it's here, it's coming, and we need to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I think as a board, we need to be very cognizant of that demographic change that is here and as we are going into budgeting, we really need to be aware of that because for me, 53 students per teacher, if you're thinking about it like that, fill this room, one person trying to teach 53 kids. That's a lot, mm -hmm. that's really a lot. And so I just ask us to keep that in mind as we move forward looking at all the different pieces. Is that another item on our list? There's a lot to do. All good points and you know, the committee of the whole we get the presentation and now it's time for everyone to roll up their sleeves another level and start working on more of the details. It would be Chris and his staff's yep. job to mm -hmm. start bringing forward recommendations. So good discussion, great presentation. Thank yeah, you, Andrea, nice. and, and your team. Keep up the great work. Uh, next is our feasibility study update. Um, Gentleman from Crabtree Rollerball. I'm not sure who's going to start, but you can decide who's going to start. Uh, AKA, as long as I sit in this chair, I call it the heavy lift. <laughs> Thank you. Um, th that was a good segue into, I think, what we're going to talk about. If you advance the second slide, I think tonight's a fairly brief presentation, but what Dr. Witham and I wanted to share a little bit of the progress. You know, we're showing checks in these first three categories, but I would say that we will be back revisiting them. As we start looking at the program, and I think um, maybe instead of the heavy lifting, the heavy thinking, 
and you know how does ESL uh, get addressed in the buildings just from a space perspective that's the programming piece we're going to now start working with the admin team uh, after these first three items have been uh, evaluated to start thinking about the future program how can the buildings uh, provide the appropriate space uh, different grade configurations. We're going to look at this from every angle possible, and that's really where our heavy lifting starts with the admin team to create the vision for what is the path forward. That first programming piece is probably the most intensive of that whole chart. Everything to date, uh, not to diminish all the other efforts, but the data-driven, sitting down with the admin team, going through the current use of space in each building to understand where we currently are today uh, was a big effort. But when you start talking about visioning and coming up with solutions to make sure the buildings provide enough space, that's what we'll be having a lot of discussions moving forward. Um, the facilities will start to dovetail at the same time in terms of their conditions and costs, because we're gonna start looking at solutions to once that programming piece gets a little bit more uh, sharper vision, we're gonna start showing you what that would look like to solve and then start giving the board some options uh, as we move forward with that last piece. Um, other than that, we're going to go through a highlight of the enrollment and really the building capacity analysis, which was our heavy lift over the last few weeks. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Witham. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. Just a couple of reminders from the last time we were here. The district has consistently um, had a slow but steady increase in enrollment. Um, you can even see years where you may have increased unexpectedly or decreased unexpectedly. You still really didn't fall too far from that trend line. Um, next slide. The other thing that we presented last time, um, just as a reminder, we did a um, validity study of your PELS um, study, which was great because you had multiple studies done over multiple years. We could compare them to projections that we prepared as well as projections that PDE prepared for you. Um, and we determined that Pell was a sophisticated, valid study that was very, very adequate for planning purposes. You can see the black line there is the um, actual enrollment, and it's, it's really charting very, very close to your Pell projections um, and well within the margin of error. So now we want to start to take that information and if we go to the next slide and start to break it out and see how that it applies to schools. Uh, one of the very first things in that process is really understanding how much space you have in your schools, how many seats you have, how those seats are affected by the programs that you offer. Um, we went down and we, uh, we did two capacities studies. PDE is a straight 25 students per classroom, whether you're a kindergarten or 12th grade. They look at every single classroom that's general instruction, assign 25 to it. At the elementary level, they do not include specials, but at the secondary level, they do include capacity for art and gym and music and those kinds of things. Um, you can see that particularly at the elementary level, this is just one example, we literally went through every school. Um, you're very, very close in most cases. When you start to get into the uh, secondary level, your capacity as you use your buildings are, is greater than uh, the capacity that PDE would calculate because you're averaging or targeting 28 per classroom where PDE was, was targeting 25. Um, to dovetail on the earlier presentation, um, when we started to look at the high school and the elementary schools, we were very familiar, obviously, there was a ton of documentation um, about the high school project that I went back to and went through. And when you compare the high school capacity when the study was done to the high school capacity now, it is dramatically different. One of the, a number of things have occurred, uh, but one is the growth in ESL classes. You know, originally when the building was built, you had a lot of small group rooms, your ESL classes were relatively small, and you could fit those kids and those teachers into those resources, small group rooms. Um, over time, your small group rooms got kind of eaten up as your um, guidance counseling office and your assistant principals moved out into the building, um, taking up the small group rooms. But no problem because you had ESL or you had full size classrooms available. So you started transferring your ESL kids into vacant spaces. You could schedule them. And now it's up to seven 
uh, full-time classrooms with up to 20 students per session in those classes. And PDE and the way that we calculate capacity is those classrooms count as zero. So you had seven, you originally probably had almost no full group, full size rooms in ESL. Now you've got seven, so you've got to take seven times 25 and subtract that from your building's capacity. So you're really starting to see a shift based on the demographics, not picking on the high school at all, but that was the one that we, you know, we found a lot of things that we had to kind of justify and, and figure out where we were. Um, you added ROTC. Um, your business program expanded. You have an in-school suspension room. Um, you've added security officers that required maybe not an instructional space, but they took other spaces that may have been offices or, or storage and those kinds of things. So we've worked through that. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so now we're starting to look at what is the capacity of your school versus what is your projected enrollment. The Pell study does not go down to each individual building. Um, so we did some initial um, math and what you're, you're seeing there is just a sample. You have some buildings that are going up, you have some buildings that are going down, you have some buildings that are relatively level. And even though you are pretty consistent in the way that your enrollment is going up, it's not geographically consistent. And you've, again, schools that are shrinking and schools that are that are increasing in enrollment. The uh, lines on there, um, the red line and the blue line, are actually the old study capacities. Um, so we're, we're narrowing those down a little bit. When we come back, we'll show you actually a little detailed report on, on each school. But you can see you know, the, the school in the top right corner, you've already passed 90% of capacity and you're headed off to 100% of capacity. Um, and so you know you've got uh, things that you're going to have to deal with um, and we're really trying to begin to identify where might those hot spots be. Um, next slide, please. So if we uh, looked at, we did look at your district capacity in each of the buildings and then your current enrollment, uh, you can see that the, uh, this is currently, this was this past October's enrollment. We always use PDEs because they report them one year apart, so we've got a, a full cycle of kids coming in and kids going out. But you've got uh, four schools that are all at the elementary level that are all over 90% of the capacity. And for educational purposes, 90% is pretty much 100% because you've got bubble classes, you've got um, you know different things that are occurring in your schedule that don't allow you to fill every classroom, every period, every day, all school year long. Think of this way, typically when an elementary student classroom goes to art, there's nobody back in their classrooms. So that classroom becomes zero as they go out to art and then come back. So you're, again, you're not gonna fill it every period, every day, every year. So we're shooting for 90% occupancy and you've got four schools that are already over that. And then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six schools on the straight line projection that are heading in that direction. You also have two schools that are actually going the opposite way. And I highlighted those in yellow, where your enrollment to capacity has decreased so much that the, um, the per seat cost for educating a child is re really starting to be increased because of the loss of efficiency uh, that's occurring in the number of students that you have in the building versus the number of students that the that the building you know can actually hold so I mean this is a really a big uh, important step for us in engaging uh, that baseline so that we can begin to determine what you have and then as as John said you're going to have to come back to us and again, a perfect example, if you came back to us and said, we're changing our, our ESL program, we're going to put one classroom in every school, or we're gonna create regional classrooms, or we're going to do X, Y, or Z, we're going to have to make sure that the vision for the program is accounted for um, in the capacity. So if you go to the, the next, I'm kind of getting a, ahead of myself, but the next slide, um, the next important piece against this baseline, which we're quickly coming to an end of establishing, will be that educational program. And I don't know, um, Mr. Bigger, if you want to 
talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that's the work uh, post the study that we're working on designing the committees right now. Um, we have 25 uh, people for the educational blueprint, and we're gonna start to lay out what that looks like. Now, we have some draft beginnings. Um, but when we lay out that blueprint, we're really starting to lay out our belief about what schools should look like, um, not just filling gaps or filling holes. And so I don't wanna be remedial in our approach. I wanna be, what, does our, what do our schools look like in 2034? How do we get ahead of our change in program? And so we're beginning to think of things like a fifth special in elementary. Do we need more students with hand, hands-on STEM projects in elementary and middle, middle school? Um, do we have comparable spaces so that we can provide comparable programming in our elementary buildings? And so we're beginning down this conversation so that we know what we wanna accomplish and then we can build that facility around that. So we've been starting these internal conversations. Kurt's ready to go, but I keep holding him back until all my staff meetings are done and I get a community survey out. Then we can move that group forward once we have all the data. But we are excited internally about laying out that possibility. Uh, we know it, um, we can't do it all, but at least we're gonna lay out what we would like to see for all schools across the district. And so um, it's a fun opportunity for us. We get excited about it, but we know it's a lot of work to get to that vision and educational programming. But it's one thing that this board had said prior to me coming in and also in discussion, education first, facility second. So we're gonna stick to, the, to that as much as possible. It's that, that really that integration of that efficiency that you seek in your building operations. I mean, you, everybody wants to be lean and mean, but more importantly, you wanna push those PA assessment and keystone scores into the green. And if you really focus only on lean and mean, you probably might leave some things that you can do for the green uh, on the table. So that's why it is so important and we're so excited to be working with the district who's really kind of peeling back the layers and doing studies like you just heard and saying, you know, this is where we are, this is where we think we want to be. Not that any district can ever come in and do everything that it wants in, you know, a single set of projects, but as the <laughs> options start to spill out, you'll begin to say, well, you know, this is a priority and we can put this on the back burner and, you know, here are some things that we can do. And in the one statement here, I said we want to identify the strategies and the limits that you can employ to improve academic programming by becoming more efficient. So strategies, again, some districts use these, some districts don't, you may find others, but typically the, the, the menu is really maintain the status quo, redistrict, realign grades, consolidate, renovate, build additions, build new schools. And in larger districts like yours, we often see kind of a combination of solutions that might come off of that, off of that list. And of course, the limit, you know, you've got constraints, you've got financial constraints, you've got time, you've got space, you've got demographics changes, you've got enrollment, and that all needs to be factored into a long-term plan for how you're gonna use these buildings educationally as well as efficiently. So as we continue to round out to the next really big milestone in the study is to kind of pull that all together alongside of the, the educational vision, um, we want to continue to look at the changing demographics, especially special education, ESL, Title I, and a number of other programs that are growing almost as aggressively as your ASL programs. Um, we want to determine the best physical distribution of special education students. Uh, throughout the district, you have a lot of regional classes that tend to get uh, clustered where there is space and there may be a better distribution. There may not be, uh, but the district is certainly, you know, that's one topic that's coming up. Um, what are the conditions and the costs that upgrade the facilities that you have? Um, and what are the options that you have? What are the strategies that you can employ given what's your, what you're going through and what uh, limits you're faced with? So we just want to come back today, give you a brief update. Again, thank the administration. I've been down here. We've been sending emails. The principals have been writing, uh, you know, their, what their uses are for every room on maps. And then I've been coming down and meeting with them. And I promise not to bug them during PA assessments. <laughs> thank you. We just had a firm-wide uh, thing talking about it's PA assessment time. Let's let's not uh, push the educators too yeah. far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions that we can answer for you? Fred, I have one for the board, um, just on other schools that you're working with. Um, 
are other schools looking to great configurations like we are some are they seeing some of the same programmatic changes we are the, there are we have a number of districts that were that are if you want to check off the boxes there I they say uh, disproportionate growth across the district school to school mm -hmm. um, the different ages of the buildings and the current conditions that they're in um, realignment is uh, when I say realignment I, we have a number of schools that are decreasing the number of grades in their elementary mm -hmm. and they're either pulling out four five six five six five six seven um, so we're, we've seen a lot of, of uh, early elementary upper elementary limited middle school like a seven eight mm -hmm. um, we've mm -hmm. seen some then they go let's pull out ninth grade out of the high school let's pull out eighth grade out of the middle school let's bring another grade level up um, mm -hmm. so again what is best for you is going to be what is best for you that you have to decide we want to be able to give you the data so that you can weigh these different strategies that you might employ to determine how you want to proceed with your with your vision that you're working on in your committees thank you When you're looking at other districts, um, how many of them divide their grade levels as we do in our middle school, having some students in one building and other students in another building? Is that a common practice? You mean in terms of like splitting up a grade level? Yes. Um, it, you know, it all depends on the size of the district. Um, a, a, just because, John always says, just because an architect can design it and build it doesn't mean that it's the best way to go about it. I mean, you could build one middle school for every single kid in the district, but it would be sprawling. Um, so again, it kind of comes down to what, what they think is, is best. Uh, one of the themes that we're hearing uh, across clients is, as far as, as those kinds of things is we want to bring our kids together as a whole class as early as possible. And some as early as possible means instead of going to four schools by the time they get to fifth grade to go to one of two. But by the time they get to seventh and eighth grade, they're only going to one and that one school carries all the way through even though they you know, leave the middle school and go to the high school. They're together as a class from seventh grade to 12th grade. Yes. That, that's my feeling that the sooner they can be together as a class, the mm -hmm. less problems in many areas. You know, and I'm sure it's such a it's such a diverse district. I mean, you go out towards Lurgan, and you've got you know beautiful open rural country, and then you come into you know a suburban urban area, uh, and you know, not that any problems are better or worse in any place, but they're different. Mm -hmm. And when the kids come together too late for the first time, often they just don't accept each other's differences as well as they mm -hmm. they could, which makes those classrooms where those teachers are dealing with. ESL, special ed needs, you know, Title I, all those other kinds of things, uh, even more complicated. Mm -hmm. On the, the big picture enrollment numbers, uh, health studies or whatever, plus just our students. I'll start with our student numbers. It said 1,200 employees over, or employees, students, 1,200 students over 30 years. That number, does that include, is that just what I call bricks and mortar students, i.e. conventional school? That doesn't include those students who are enrolled? Homeschooled, yeah. uh, private school, charter, cyber. Is not included. Is not included. And, so, sorry, go ahead. I guess on that same, when, you, when we try to compare against projections, whether that's Pell, PDE, XYZ, how do those entities, do they factor in cyber school, home school, when they're doing, or they're just doing uh, high school, elementary age students in the geographic area? Or do they factor in, a, is there a factor for that? Indirectly, uh, but not directly. So any kids that are on a regular cycle of coming and going in and out of your school, and I don't mean individual students, but groups of students that may, you know, we leave in middle school and then we come back in high school or whatever the case may be. That change between the two would be cooked into the enrollment projections. 
what wouldn't be cooked into the Roman projections if the state came down and said, okay, we're, ch we're gonna do charter school reform and we're going to um, make it much more difficult for a, um, I don't know how to diplomatically say this, but a, a, a very, I don't know, affluent school budget in charter schools you know, if they all of a sudden didn't have that same layer of cushion that they have now, they're not operating libraries, they're not operating buses, they're not, you know, so on and so on, you could find that either they just shudder or the quality of the education isn't as good, so kids start to return. Um, there's no really good way to count that in. If you prepare those seats and they don't come, you're, you're heating and cooling spaces that you don't need. If they come to you too quickly, you have to figure out what to do. We've been saying that for 20 years about cyber school yeah. reform, so <laughs> I think we'll be saying it for about 20 yeah. more. You can, call it, you can call it charter space, not charter school. That's yeah. fine, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we would have 1,300 more students if you know everybody came back. We wouldn't have room for them. Uh, but I don't anticipate that's going to be major changes to us. I wouldn't think so. Uh -huh. You know, we have clients in the Philadelphia area that, you know, have large populations. We've got, interestingly, clients that have a large Amish population and a big home school. And, and we watch them go back and forth. And, you know, the core of them, there really doesn't seem to be a threat to the, the, the opportunity not to attend public school and do something different yeah. that your parents want for you. So, I mean, it's... It's hard to plan for. I wouldn't put too much dollars into holding seats when you're on a yeah. tight budget and dealing with demographic changes. I'm more concerned the other way. Let's build the programming so they want to stay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's more of our problem in front of us. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the initial opening slide, the one with the check marks on it, please? Um, maybe this is question I've often had is what what box or is it in any of these circles with checks or soon to be checks when you do what I call um, synergies whereas you see we have some schools that are continuing to burst at the seams and you have other schools where the percentage is going down so at what point in the study or will it be part of the study, whereas you look at synergies of taking maybe a group of four buildings and turning them into three, or changing the program in programming in three of the four and then reprogramming the fourth. What I, I call it synergies with um, support. Cost staff, efficiencies, cost right? Efficiencies. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually doing that with a lot of districts right, right now. Um, is that going to be part of this? That's going to yeah. be part of it. And what we'll, we'll provide yeah. for you your like five, six, a 95% capacity. Ideally, you could take 85 kids out of this building. Now, if you had 85 kids out of this building, where could they possibly go? And there's geographic answers to that. Now, whether the school district wants to do that or not, that's totally up to you guys. <laughs> but we want to say, if that's a strategy that you want to employ, along with any of the others we mentioned, um, here's what you would have to do in order to move the correct number of kids to get to the right spaces. If you decided you're going to do grade realignment, like one of your big neighbors down the road is in the process of discussing, they're taking elementary students to grade levels out of their elementary school. Mm -hmm. It solves all of their overcrowding problems, but they have a number of schools that are also <laughs> shrinking. So when you take two grades out of a building that's already declining, the wind is whistling through the hallways, and now they have to decide, oh, this works educationally, this works for the overcrowded buildings, now what do we want to do? Geographically, they may be so remote that you just say we have to live with that inefficiency, or you could say, listen, I can combine these three, drop one, and redistribute the kids, and we're gonna, have, we're gonna be leaner and meaner and have our services better centralized. Yeah, generally, the more you, aggressive you consolidate, the more efficient you become, Yes. generally. Generally, but yeah. then you have to weigh the cons of that. If yeah. there's educational cons, Correct. or maybe there are some educational pros uh, by reprogramming. I think we'll have more benefits than we what? will yeah. than cons on that. That's yeah. the there's, there's more the pros. That's yeah. That's down to the fifth and sixth part there. Yeah. yeah. There are more pros. 
The other question we'll get to is, you may have a district or a building and we say, we're going to target 90%, but you probably don't want to fill a building that's already projected to grow to 90% of the projection. Maybe mm -hmm. those couple of buildings you only want to fill to 85% or 80%, where another building that's shrinking, you can move in the kids to 90% and still continue to gain classrooms over the next 10 years. So some of the principles we're going to start coming up with that you'll help us is, What's the smallest elementary school you would like? What's the largest? Do we want students uh, mixing sooner and at what grade level? So if we say we would like to see fifth grade come together, then we're doing a five, six building. And then we say, OK, building's no larger than. So that gives us those guiding principles to design our options around that you'll be able to help us with. We'll do the ed programming, but we're still going to need those guiding principles. And we'll come ask for that feedback from you as a board, which will help really determine you know, how many schools we have. Cool. That's the beginning for you. So all of this by October, November is, yes. our, is our goal for you all is to have option analysis and recommendations to you October, November. And we'll continue to come back and brief you as we move through the process before the final report. Mm -hmm. This information is very helpful. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Now on to how we pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I told him the other day as a retired superintendent, that's the stuff that still makes my palms sweat. <laughs> you get to leave now. Yeah. That's good, Fred. Yeah, exactly. Good for you. Good for you. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of this pretty quickly as it's information that is repeated from our uh, first presentation back in February. Next slide, Dave. Just as a reminder, uh, what we did in February is we talked about our expenditure assumptions, our revenue assumptions, showed what the projected deficit was. We didn't have a surplus at 4%, and then talked about what our next steps were. Next slide, Dave. So for forecast two, uh, we looked at what were certain additional things. You heard uh, Mr. Bigger reference. You're going to see something in there for the ELL program for the number of kids that are expanding. We added some additional expenditures. Uh, Danette and I took another look at the revenue in terms of how it's trending. We adjusted some assumptions there. We have a new projected deficit. And we'll talk a little bit about next steps. We do have a change there as well. Next slide, Dave. So real quickly, I'm not going to go over this in detail. These were the um, assumed, uh, yeah, assumed, excuse me, it's getting late, assumed uh, expenditure assumptions that we built in. And you can tell that we broke that down by employee and also contracts, salaries, and benefits. Um, we also put in there our cap reserve resolution, which the board passed uh, last June, and then increases that are due to inflation or just simply the cost of doing business. Our, our costs are going up, and we're going to maintain the same level of services. Next slide, Dave. So for forecast two, uh, not as much stuff going into uh, the expenditure side additional. We did add another almost $1.8 million of additional instructional expense. Uh, most of that is earmarked towards the special ed services. And we added uh, support services, additional expenditures. A lot of this is uh, transportation. Uh, you've seen in the board report that our transportation is going to be over budget this year. That's primarily due to increase in special ed placements and homeless uh, populations. Uh, so looking into next year, we felt we needed to increase that line item. Um, and then the additional programming, uh, the ask was for 500000 to be added for servicing the growing ELL population. So another additional 2.9, almost $3 million of expenditures have been added to the second forecast. Next slide, Dave. So again, looking at our, our goal, which is to be sustainable and stable, uh, the breakdown for the second forecast bringing in everything from the first one, we have added over $13 million of expenditures. A little over 4,300,000 uh, is towards our employee groups, salary and benefits. 
uh, debt service, the, the resolution of $1 million. Increases due to uh, inflation of the cost of doing business is seven, $7,300,000. And again, just that additional programming that is above and beyond the sustain, sustaining and stable is the 500000 earmarked for ELL. And just again, as a reminder, this budget forecast, it, it does not have any ESSERS funding in that. That will be expended all by June 30th of this coming year. Next slide, Dave. Okay, so this is an ad. Um, one of the things that have been driving um, budgetary increases over the last several years, of course, has been special education. We're seeing more students, students with higher needs. So Mr. Baker had asked me to share with the board what budgetary transfers have we had to do over the last four years. Um, and when we say budgetary transfer, this is money coming out of the budgetary reserve. Um, so they're expending beyond what we increase their year over year budget. Um, two. So over the last four years, a little over $9,800,000 has been transferred out of the budgetary reserve to support special education, and that's an average of just around $2.5 million over those four years. Next slide, Dave. So I can't see those. No, I can see them over here. I can't see the numbers over there. So this is a, just a look at our actual expenditures in special education. This is everything we charge to what we call our 1200 function. There are items in our budget that are charged that directly go towards supporting special education students, but it's more like speech therapy, OT. Those things are not classified under the 1200 function. And you can see that over the last 10 years, we've gone from a little over $13 million in total expenditures for our special education to uh, just over 24 million uh, that we finished last year. So that's a growth of over $10,600,000. The biggest category uh, driving the expansion of this cost has been in our 500 objects, which are basically tuition. And these are students that we're putting in outplacements. Um, for example, we have students that we take to New Story in Carlisle. That gets charged to a tuition account. So we have a lot more kids going out. Um, the 300 objects are, again, these are contracted services. We've seen a, a dramatic increase in that area. This is additional PCAs that have had to be filled with contracted employees because we don't have those positions filled. So 78% increase in total expenditures over that 10-year period. Next slide, Dave. Okay, forecast one, we're starting to go into uh, the revenue side of this budget. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of these in detail. You can see that we took a look at our interim real estate taxes, we increased that. Uh, we increased earned income tax fairly significantly based on trend. And then also interest income, you're gonna see on next slide, or I'm sorry, down at the bottom, that taking a look at where interest income is trending and what we had in the initial budget, Danette and I felt like we could bump that up about another million dollars. Rates are still over 5% at Pliget. We keep the majority of our money there until we need to pull it over into uh, Orstown to make payments. Um, we also increased our payments in lieu of taxes. That's just really an adjustment. We have a couple of those out there. And then where you see the uh, rental decrease, this was really due to uh, we no longer have the lease agreement with the tax office, so we adjusted that line item. Next slide, Dave. So uh, we look at our assessment base uh, pretty much monthly. Uh, this number where you see the seven, 772 million uh, was increased by just under 100 million. That's based, or 100,000, no, I'm sorry, 1 million. Um, that is based on the actual numbers from the county assessment office. Modifying that assessment base, we will collect another $118,000 in real estate tax revenue. Next slide, Dave. If I'm going too fast, slow me down, but I don't wanna, I know we've gone over some of these before, so. Okay, thank you. Um, on to the state revenue. Basically, the slide is exactly how you saw it the last time. We have not made any adjustments. Um, Mr. Bigger and I have talked a lot about the governor's proposed budget. It is very aggressive. Uh, so at this point, we're staying with our um, philosophy that we've had for the last couple of years, which is we're not putting those into the budget until they're, they're approved because it's, it's just too much to absorb if it doesn't come through. So no changes on the state side. Next slide, Dave. And we're into our federal sources, and again, these were all that you saw uh, last time. Uh, the 
then again, the, we don't have any ESSERS money. Uh, for the final budget, uh, you heard Mr. Whitman talk last board meeting that um, we did get notification that we received the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act grant. It's a little, a little bit of a tongue tie, uh, twister. So it's about 1.6 million. Um, working right now with uh, Kurt and Bobby in my office to try to determine how much of that's going to come in and go out this current next fiscal year. So we will be adding that in for the final forecast. Next slide. So just as a comparison on the revenue total side, uh, for forecast one, we had increased revenue around 7.1 million, almost 7.2 million. For the second forecast, we've increased revenue um, by 8 million, almost 800, 805, I can't talk tonight, 8 million, 500,000. So the increase in revenue from forecast over forecast is just under 1.3 million. Next slide. Oh, thanks, Dave's already ahead of me. And again, this is just a look at the governor's budget. I told you it was very aggressive on the basic ed side. Uh, his proposal has uh, Chambersburg getting another $8.4 million. That's almost a 29% increase over year over year. We more than likely will not know what is coming of that until July 1st, if we're lucky. Uh, sometimes it's a lot, lot, lot after that. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the special ed side, uh, his budget increase was just a little over $252,000 for that line. So around 4.65% for a total of over eight, almost $8.7 million. Um, as a side note, um, just as the, we would talk about the cyber charter schools, there was also conversation with um, some representatives about the special ed funding at my conference, the PASBO conference, and the message that was really pretty com much coming down from the state is special education is a federal law, so the feds sort of need to take care of that revenue stream. I, don't, I took from that we're not gonna see much more coming from the state to support our special education needs. And then if you look, the governor's proposed budget um, is proposing to change the funding mechanism for cyber charter schools only. Um, if that would come through, I think it's $8,000 per regular ed student, we're estimating that that could save us just under $1.7 million if it comes through. Yeah. Okay, so next slide, and this is really hard to read, I, I apologize, but we can't get um, it on there any larger. Looking at the second forecast, uh, we're estimating our total revenues to be around $185 million, total expenditures around $188 million, projecting a $2.6 million deficit. And that is at a 4% tax increase, 3% for operating revenue, 1% to fund uh, future capital projects. Um, next slide, Dave. And this just gives you a, a look at what tax revenue increase we would generate. Up at 0%, you're still seeing about $600,000. That's purely due to the growth of the assessment base. At each percentage, you're going up about a million dollars. Next slide, Dave. And th this is showing you uh, where we are with our revenue in terms of our expenditures and what the deficit projection would be if we went zero, one, two, three, four percent. Again, you're going up about a million dollars or in deficit uh, at each reduction of percentage. Okay, next slide. So taking a look at where our sources are coming from, and you saw this is very similar to the first presentation. 63% um, of our revenue comes from local sources, so that's real estate taxes, earned income taxes, local service taxes, for just around and $117 million. 31% um, comes from the state, about $58 million. Small portion comes from the federal. <laughs> uh, under 4,500,000, we spend a lot of time working on those 2% of, of ex revenues that we have to do. And then the other source is our budgetary reserve. That's a one-time source, um, and it sits on the, the revenue side of the budget as well as the expenditure side. Next slide, Dave. Um, this is just a three-year comparison of our revenues. So we've got the actual from 22-23. We've got the budget from 23-24 uh, and what is proposed in 24-25. The major takeaway from this is that um, you know, you're seeing the, the local sources going up while the state sources have gone up as well. Um, we're not seeing much growth in the federal side. Next slide, Dave. 
Oh, he's, he's right ahead of me. OK. So taking a look at our expenditure side, again, we have $188 million in this proposed 24-25 budget. The majority of that is uh, salary and benefits, uh, a little over 120 million, or 64% of our budget. Um, our purchase services, these are contracts. They can range from contracted speech to PCAs to um, buses, uh, just all of the different contracts that we have in order to support our, our students. That's just around $40 million, or 22% of our budget. And then you see supplies, which is about 4%. And that's everything we charge to our 600 object. It's probably where we have the most discretion in terms of people being able to make decisions about what's being spent. Uh, but we also have in there gas and diesel. So there's some other things that go into that category. And it's a very small percentage of our budget, around 7 million or 4%. And then other expenditures, um, this area encompasses our debt service, our budgetary reserve, am I missing anything? So it's interest and debt. So um, I think that's pretty much the, the three areas that are on that line item. And if you take a look, 86% of our budget is tied up in salaries, benefits, and contracts. Next slide, Dave. Sorry. I. Messed my slide up. OK. So taking a th uh, three-year look at um, our expenses, and again, this is by object, so salary and benefits, purchase services. And you can see the growth area is basically in the salary and benefits. Um, the, the blue area and the gray area supplies has been very uh, stagnant. And other expenditures have gone up. Some of that is debt service. Some of that is the use of um, fund balance. OK, next slide, Dave. I will miss wrapping up here. So um, looking at our budget from our major functions, again, just trying to show how we uh, categorically account for our expenditures. Instruction is the biggest part of our pie. It's 63% or over um, $117 million. The support services, this does encompass a lot of student-directed support, such as nursing and counseling and psych services, speech, therapy. Uh, I don't know, do a lot of different things where they might not be directly instructing students, but they're there to support the students as well. This also has administration, transportation, um, buildings and grounds, um, and uh, technology. So that's around 27% um, of our budget or around 50, 50 million. And then operation of non-instructional services, these are areas that we classify in our 3,000 3, function. And they're more like athletics um, or community support groups for or community services for our students. And then the other finances and uses is, again, where our debt service sits, both the principal and the interest, and also our fund balance. And just as a note, um, our debt service represents about 6% of our budget. Next slide. OK, expenses by function. Again, you can just see the three-year trend. We're looking at actuals uh, in 2023, our budget for 2024, and what we're proposing in 2025. And you can see the areas um, and the pieces of the pie in terms of what um, the budget is represented by. OK, next slide. So slight change. Um, I told Chris yesterday I had a little bit of a panic uh, because we changed the structure of the board meetings. And normally, we bring our uh, proposed final to the board the first meeting in May. Um, since that is now just a committee of the whole, we will be bringing forward the proposed final budget to the board on, at the 23rd meeting in April. Um, what this will allow us to do, especially for the new board members, is to go ahead and advertise that the board has the intent to adopt a final budget. We, by law, have to provide at least 30 days of advertising prior to the adoption of the final budget. And that will be done June 4th. Any questions? I was looking at the, the slide for special education. And it's, it appears to me that for the year 20, starting at 2021, for those four years up to 23, 24, that should we be budgeting more money in the special ed because each year we're, we're over? And I didn't know if there's a reason why mm -hmm. when we see each year for four years in a row that it's, it's more costly. Should we be putting more in the budget instead of doing a budget transfer? Well, we have. We have put more in the budget. Um, it's just that they have gone over the additional items in the budget. So we have year over year put additional money into special ed. It's just that the expenditures have exceeded the additional budget dollars. Right, but 
I, I guess I'm thinking for next year, yes. when you're looking at that average, we should go significantly higher. Yeah. And I do have that for you, Dr. Diller. Um, we have in the 24-25 budget, and I have to put my glasses on, I have this number. Sherry, uh, Kurt presented at the last meeting that you missed. Do you want to just do a brief overview of that? Correct. Um, Oh, I'm just wondering if it should be higher and if you have the yes. number much um, higher. Yes, and at the end, I, we promised the board that we were looking at that and that we were, uh, in the end, not going to have budget transfers this high. So we are at, it is significantly higher. Um, our Schedule A, we've bumped up quite a bit. We have uh, 14 PCAs that we had to add that have been added throughout the year. Um, we have three speech services uh, in the budget, but we also have a deduct there because of paying contracted services anywhere from 85 to $95 an hour. And uh, we denoted all the contracts looking forward and trend those out. So we, we have done that in this budget. Um, you know, it's okay. a, a significant number. It's in yeah. several million dollars that, that's going yeah. on. It's around 4.4 okay, million good. that we've yeah. added to this. And they've budget. spent multiple days trying to get their handle on this that we've never done before. So I do appreciate all their work. We feel better about it. We have an Good. internal uh, bet on whether it's going to come in for a $700,000 transfer next year or over a million. Not to be joking about it, but that's what we're trying to keep it within that <laughs> because of the work they've done. So we got to make our jobs fun sometimes. So we have some internal uh, betting on how much it'll go up. Um, but it's it's hard. It's hard. Uh, another thing that <laughs> another comment just on this is um, they wanted to ask about see if we can do uh, something different here is at this uh, Franklin Learning Center um, there are extra rooms at that at that building and you know as, as we look at these outside placements mm -hmm. on these students and I know there's some work being done there, there but is. but you know these transportation costs get very expensive to do these outside placements and when we have empty classrooms sitting there we've got I I, I think that we can save a boatload of money. Yeah, we're looking at several options, some at FLC and some even in other buildings so that we can bring some of those kids back that we're you know, sending to Newville and Carlisle yes. to be local that'll help with our transportation. I, I don't want to get too much into that because we're working on those right now. I have a right. meeting next week just on, on uh, those options. Yep. No, I think so, that's fa yeah. fabulous and, and because absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I think we can do some some significant savings there. Tammy, so, um, you yes. have a deficit, but am I correct that if even a quarter of the anticipated mm -hmm. budget from the yes. state comes in, that'll be wiped away? That that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. we'll actually have a surplus should we get fifty percent. Could be, yes. If we don't transfer <laughs> special ed money. Yes. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's a philosophy thing. You know, I told Chris, like, the last couple of years, the state's projections have just been, like, out there. I mean, we've never seen these types of increases. So it makes business people a little nervous that it's just not going to come through. And, um, you know, we could put it in and put it in yeah. as a one-time transfer. If it doesn't come, it doesn't come. But we've always had a budgetary reserve so that if we get additional funding, our spending limit is up to that $5 million additional yeah. budgetary reserve. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not suggesting putting it in, but we have to have that mindset of it really is not likely to be a deficit. Right. I, right. I would say if I had to bet, no. I would right. say it's yeah. probably close to being zero or a little bit of a surplus right, right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, Wait, what, I'm glad Faye asked that question. Oh. Sorry, Ben, because oh. my business mind was like, there is no way in heaven. I, I my heart hurt looking at that. Mm -hmm. So knowing that that's not in there and that you feel comfortable that whatever comes from the state will cover that makes me feel a lot better mm -hmm. than I was feeling when I saw that originally. Yeah, because yeah. I know these budgets are different than what I deal with on a daily basis. So right. thank and, you, Faye, for asking that question. And we're really good at doing a worst case scenario generally when you go through the budget process. I mean, well, we yeah, try absolutely. To be accurate, oh, I do that all the time too. Yeah. It's like if you yeah, have to, if right. we can't get anything, this is what it's going right. to be, and right. then you just you know pretty much know, but. Yeah. That was one of the questions, just being a novice to the whole process. Mm -hmm. And while we're here, I just want to say thank you because I know that you let us come in that day and you went over stuff with us. So you've been very transparent about the process and, and how you're doing things. And I really appreciate all the information that you're giving us that, that everybody gave us uh, and has been so 
I feel like maybe in the past that wasn't the case, but mm-hmm. I feel like I have gotten since I've been on the board a wealth of information. And anytime I've asked a question, somebody has been more than willing to answer mm-hmm. it in a way that with facts and data, and that's how I process. So thank you guys You're all welcome. so much. Yeah, and I have to say I can't do this alone. Danette is is a big part of that. She. She keeps me straight most of the time, so yeah, you're welcome. So last year, last year when we went through the budget, then we ended up getting more money from the state. Mm-hmm. Then we had that extra money. Then we had to figure out what the priorities were for that money. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, do you remember how much came in that we weren't anticipating? Yeah, I think it was, yeah that was from the BEF, and I think it was closer to five with with special ed, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So that makes that makes a, a big difference because I noticed there's not any intervention specialists added in. There's right. ELL, but mm-hmm. no, none of those added in. Another question I had from the the grant that's coming through this significant grant that's coming through. Uh, mm-hmm. from, how much is that again? About one point six. One point six. Yeah. Can that be used for elementary behavior? No. Uh, support at all or is it all no. secondary well when we made the application we made it for specific things and they had guidelines of what right. you could apply for um, they did deny a couple of the things that we wanted uh, but the basic pieces of the pie are going to be funding the the, the educational mm-hmm. space mm-hmm. down here the three different classrooms that mm-hmm. we presented you know to mm-hmm. our curriculum instruction committee um, there's also when you talk about behavior in elementary there is a uh, I sent the email tonight to you. I think it's almost two hundred thousand dollars over two years that we can devote towards like pause behavior supports and and programs in the yeah, elementary. I thought I heard that. Yeah, yeah. and um, I might have put that in the in the Friday folder. And then we have uh, back on track the the uh, for the high school with the kids with a lot of truancy issues to help fund that for two years for credit recovery. Uh, that was an important piece that that was approved. And um, I'm missing one piece. Um, the suspension. The, oh, the uh, alternative instruction for middle school students. So w- we're not suspending kids home. Right. So they will have a place right. to work on. So supporting a staff member that goes between the two middle schools. Uh, actually, I think, it, yeah, two middle schools for two years that will uh, support basically instead of doing out of school suspension, al- alternative instruction where they're going to get support and they're going to have to do their work but it's gonna be in a uh, small environment. I think that grant is just going to make such a big difference for our district. I mean, that's massive. But did I hear you say there is elementary money there, 200,000? It's roughly about that for uh, PBIS uh, Positive support Positive behavior schools. support. Right. Sta- mm-hmm. So that, that could be, in fact. Because they behavior. really didn't have money budgeted help support implementing the PBIS at all of our schools. Well, that's what I mean. Right. There's That's been a deficit. We've had right. we've really struggled to put it in, uh, you know, PBIS. And, uh, like, uh, I don't know if Ms. Harbaugh knows, but that was a PBIS uh, award that you helped out at. Yes, so yeah, she actually helped out at one of the PBIS events, but they really are doing it on, on uh, you know, a minimal amount of money that they have at their fingertips. So this is gonna help support them to do award events and also you know, put up positive signs around the school and different programs and different professional development for the kids, whether it's on bullying. You know, that was one of our things that they really wanted us to work on in the survey. So yes, over two years they're gonna have a nice amount of money that they can, we're gonna divvy up between the, the schools based off enrollment, so. Well, that's, that's excellent. So yeah. thank whoever put all that grant together yeah. needs to be applauded for that. That's, that's just absolutely significant. Well, speaking of grants, I just noticed on something that came through um, PSBA that there's several mental health grants that are... I could talk about that as okay. well if you want. Um, so we, April we, and one May. Day yeah, months. we applied for, for those. We did re- the PCCD grant, I think is what you're referring to. Um, part of that is safety that uh, there was a certain amount... Bobby's there, Bobby's the one who puts all the grants. I give her a lot of the information, and I compile all the information. But she may know the number. Um, we have four hundred and seventeen thousand that is competitive grants. Uh, we are going to be getting the uh, the piece where we are able to get two 
one and a half therapists for the last year, which our counselors say we desperately need, we're actually able to bump it up uh, to two therapists this year. So uh, we are getting uh, some more support from those grants. So two of them were pretty much, we apply for them, we get them. The other one's competitive and we have some uh, nice things that we asked for in there that we hope we get to. And that, that is up to 417,000. We haven't heard back from, from that one yet. So these are the new ones that just came out recently? Yes. That are, the applications are due in April and in May? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Those are the ones, well, we had ours in, so. Yeah, it's the PCCD grant. That's significant. Thank you for putting it for those grants. Mm -hmm. Tammy, just to follow up. Yeah couple on the earlier questions sort of and then add in at the same time um, do you have any idea and maybe not this time next time where we are year to date uh, budget versus actual not for this time but we can have that for you next time yeah yeah okay. an estimate yeah, yeah. we can Be do that because that to the the comments earlier I think last year when we looked at the three plus one we were somewhere in that two million dollar deficit, and then we got yeah. an additional four to five. Yeah, I don't. We don't million more foresee that we're going to have an operating deficit. Although mm -hmm. I will tell you that the special ed transfer, you're going to have a uh, transfer coming for transportation uh, around 455 million. Or yeah, sorry, thousand. It's getting a little late. I'm starting to get tongue tied. Um, we also, uh, in the current budget, we increased our cyber charter uh, amount to seven million. We're projecting that's going to be about 400,000 over, just due to the number of kids there and the classification. So. We're going to be draining a little bit of that uh, reserve, but we still believe that there won't be a huge deficit. We'll have a, a slight surplus, surplus. But we can do that for you in the next one. Yeah. Or, or maybe before the final, because the next one's going to be <laughs> in two weeks. Actually, you, you teed up one of my, one of my other comments yeah. that you know, yeah, when we do, when, <laughs> if, if, when, we do get our additional money from the state, mm -hmm. uh, as a board, let's be careful of not thinking we have to spend it mm -hmm. in the first two months, knowing that there's always these uh, not so kind Easter eggs that are on the horizon, mm -hmm. for, horizon for us. And then the other thing, and, and maybe someday, uh, Chris, and Tammy, you and I can sit down, just if for no other reason, uh, just a little refresher for new board members on our plus one, mm -hmm. when, when we say three plus one, that's actually plus one this year in addition to the plus one from last mm -hmm. year. And, and how we project, I know uh, John Fry, I think put something together for us. It's mm -hmm. when we were looking about an $80 million worth of capital projects. Mm -hmm. That number's probably close to 100 million mm -hmm. now. Well, mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be dependent on what comes out of right. the, the blueprint, yeah. But, like to maybe even resurrect his old slide okay. and just show that for, for what this what we would need to to finance what the eighty plus, million. What this plus plus yeah. X mm -hmm. I'll call X plus Y. What this plus Y is all about and where it goes to. Okay. Without additional debt service, it goes to capital reserve. Correct. But eventually, you know, we're building we're building. A, we have a plan to have in the next seven eight years nine ten million in additional debt service yeah. mm -hmm. and right. we know we can't raise taxes at one time to get right. nine ten million in a year we're stepping up to it right so we need to preserve that money as absolutely that service yeah. is coming down the road yeah. i'd like uh, another conversation to get like double dutch around here but i'd like to hear what my colleague was going to say at the end there Ben, you were going to say something and kind of got that. Um, I think that was about the budget from the governor. I was just curious to know what the... The number is. So, it's, well, I'm saying it's 8.4. Yeah. My, I guess my question is, like, what, what's the lowest do you think that would be? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what's... We can bank on at least... What, wow. what was it last year? It was four or five? Yeah. Yeah. So we should... Can we bank on four or five? No. no. 
Okay. No. Uh, two, two, right, uh, you give us one more month, we'll have a better answer, because we're hearing no rhetoric. Nothing right now. We, we usually get signs, symbols, like, hey, we're hearing this, we're hearing that. We're not hearing anything. Nothing. Crickets. So um, we would be um, remiss to put a number on it right now. Just like uh, the converse of that is what Tammy mentioned and what I just said. If you want to bank on additional revenue, i.e. look into our crystal ball, then you need to also look into crystal ball on what are going to be the expenditures that go over. Mm -hmm. And it's not just one-sided, you know. Right. Cyber, special ed, transportation, you, you know, Tammy just went through the list. Yeah. We know darn well there's going to be other areas that run over. Yeah, we're so, at about $4 million right now with yeah. us. Um, special ed, cyber, and transportation close this to year. Mm -hmm. So basically, our overages offset what we almost darn near everything we, we yeah. received in additional revenue. I mean, there will be some areas that we see some savings. savings. I'm just looking by department at this point in time. You know, we'll probably have some in the salary and benefit lines, but uh, we no longer have the huge or large attritional savings because we're hiring people mm -hmm. at higher salaries, teachers, because we have to. So we'll have some savings there just because of the open positions and stuff. But um, Danette, I mean, she, I, I got to give her credit. There are times I'm like, can you look in this area and see if we got any extra in salary and benefits? And we try to move that money first uh, before coming to the reserve. So, yeah. But we'll, we'll take a look at it, uh, Mr. Norcross, and try to give you an estimate. My, uh, that was just minor detail. My, uh, I think my bigger question is, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I've, I think we're all aware the, <laughs> that as a district, we have a lot of pressing needs, and this budget does not address quite a few of them. And I'm not going to rehash <laughs> all the points uh, unless you want me to. Um, but I, I want to know, are there other people on the board that th this is our once in a year opportunity uh, right now, I think we're at 4%. If I understand correctly, that means we're leaving $3 million on the table. We have an opportunity where we could potentially invest in some of these areas where we, uh, I continue to hear teachers, administrators, community members, parents talk about a host of pressing issues that uh, we could be discussing solutions you know, with this budget. Um, but if I'm the only one that feels that way, then, I, you know, that's fine. Um, so I want to hear, uh, of the needs that you hear about in the district, are there some tonight that we want to have some discussion about? Let, why don't we, you know, and, and many of the needs are not one-time fixes. You know, it's not stuff that we can just say, well, if we spend this amount of money, then it will be done, right? A lot of this stuff is multi-year, and so, um, yeah, it'd be nice even even looking towards the future, thinking about educational programming. We know that Chris has dreams and aspirations for helping our kids to achieve academically, but it's also going to take investment. So, do we want to start setting money aside? For, so, I would love to hear from all of you. Is there is there anything that's not included in the budget that you think we really ought to be including? No, I'd be happy to comment on that. Um, so, Chris, you sent out a a uh, report that showed the uh, what the staff felt about you know mm -hmm. and what they thought were high priorities and I took a look at that and I was like well, well, it was a preliminary draft of about ha half the buildings have given back so okay. far we have a half yet to go but yes preliminary so I'll make an assumption that there there may be some agreement with the other yeah, places you yeah, visit yeah, yeah the trends trends on on track Could yeah. be. so I looked at uh, it looked to me there were like five areas that generated the most interest. ELL, which we heard uh, Andrea Mills talk about. Uh, special Ed, of course, Kurt talked about that today and last, last meeting. Student behavior, interventions, and school counselors. Yep. And I know they all require a cost investment, but I look at that as an investment, and we're already from 70 to 100 vacancies uh, running consistently. Not all of them are going to address these five areas because I don't think a janitor is going to be involved in this stuff, but could be. But um, yeah, we have all these vacancies. We have a need for personnel to be filling 
uh, slots and providing services for these students in these areas and how do we ignore that? We, we say we're for the students, for, for the kids. Um, that means we may make some adults very, very angry because we're raising taxes. But I'm sorry, it's not about them, it's about the kids. So I say, uh, if we have to raise taxes, that might be something we can consider. It doesn't mean it's a done deal, but I don't think it should be off the table. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, I think we're all here to invest in kids across all the programs, ELL, um, special ed. Special ed is expensive. Mm -hmm. And frequently I get questions about, well, why are these kids all here? Why don't we send them someplace else? Well, this is America, and we're all entitled to a free and quality public education. And it's our job to do the best to make sure that the little money that we have is spread equitably across all of the programs that need our help. It's a, it's a heavy lift, um, but I agree with what Mike said. If we need to see a tax increase, no one wants to pay more in taxes, but don't we all want to invest in the future of this community? Like, really? So. Well, let me ask this. I hear time and time again that 60% are free and reduced. So what is a 7% tax increase gonna to do to those people? Because they're gonna hit it just like the people who can actually afford to pay it, that are a little more affluent. So it's not like we can pick and choose the people that can take that 7% hit a lot more than other people. I'm not saying that we wouldn't in a perfect world be able to do that, but you have 60, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about 60% that are free and yeah, reduced correct, across. Correct. Mm -hmm. So while it's admirable to be able to do that and I just find it challenging to say, you're already at free and reduced. Mm -hmm. Let's add 7% onto the taxes that you now have to pay for us to educate your children, but where are you coming up with that money when you're already at free and reduced? And how are we affecting that? That's a genuine question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a point that um, a recent, I forget where I read it, but more than 50% of the homes in the borough and in Chambersburg at large are rental properties. Mm -hmm. And so who's the 60% that you're referring to that might not be able to pay that tax increase? It's those landlords that are paying the tax increase. And from what I know, what I've read about, what I've observed is that there's not a lot of improvement being made to those homes. And the landlords are probably doing quite well in, in renting those properties. So it's the landlords who would be paying the extra money. Can you give me facts and data to say that? Um, I, I can look, yeah. Yeah, I can give you data. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I don't know specifically to all of your question, but I know like uh, in the borough of Chambersburg, 45% of people own their own home. So 55% yeah. have rentals. Yeah, I know that for a fact too. Okay. It's 50-50. You know, about as well. That, and you can, from you can just get like that, U.S. Census you know, so. provides that. So what yeah. happens when, let's play that out. Right. What happens, you raise taxes 7% and the landlord goes, mm, I'm not absorbing that, so now your rent is going up. We've done 0% tax increases and the landlord still raised the rent. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really think that that's a deal breaker for whether or not they raise the rent. So you don't think a landlord lord will raise their rent? If they if their tax bill doubles, well, nobody's gonna double the tax bill. But uh, uh, okay, you're right. You add four. You add 140 percent to tax bill. Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm saying. The the landlord will raise the rent. Yes. Okay. And the, but and how, then, how much then, more will who, he who, raise? Who pays that rent? Isn't that the same 60% free and reduced lunch or 45% renters? Isn't that who's ultimately paying that at the end? And it's going to be a $50 raise in one situation and 150 if we raise the taxes to that landlord. 
significantly? I don't think most landlords are hurting. <laughs> they're they're going to raise the rent regardless of what we do. Yeah. That's that's what I'm convinced of. Well, yeah, and that's uh, no, I understand what you're saying. They're going to raise the rent x amount. You raise their property tax 7%, they're raising that rent x amount plus 7% to cover what the, landlords aren't going to lose money. That doesn't make business sense. Right. Uh, it just doesn't. And, and I know that that probably sounds crass to a lot of people and it sounds insensitive. Business is business. And, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, other things don't get to factor into that. So uh, I just, I don't, know where, I don't know where your middle ground is on that because somebody has to pay at some point. And, and is it ultimately gonna fall back on the very people that we're trying to help that are already in that free and reduced. That's my concern. That's a genuine question concern yeah. that I have because I don't know that you can tell me that that's not going to happen. And if you can't tell me that's not going to happen, then we're just robbing Peter to pay Paul in an effort to make it look like we're trying to help, but we're really not because ultimately the person we want to help is paying on the back end anyway. Carl, Does that make sense what I'm saying? Carl, you're mm. leaning into your mic there. <laughs> Yo, that's okay. Let's definitely talk. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> can I get that on the record? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I agree with Stephanie, probably a lot of the places, they're not improving. I mean, you know, the landlords aren't. But it's human nature, the greed. I'm going to get the money, and that's it. Unless someone pressures them to improve it, they're not going to do it, you know. In that, but you know, I I'm the same thing. It's gonna be, it's gonna go in the backs of the people, no matter what, uh, because uh, I agree with Stephanie. They're in it to make money. They're not just renting to, hey, I'm a nice guy, I'm renting here. There's a few out there like that, but that's not human nature. No, Lance. Yeah, <laughs> y'all know, y'all already know where I come from. When I came, when I first came onto this board, the very first. Thing that I said was we need to get back to loving one another. We were in the middle of the pandemic and I'm going to go back to that. I'm going to constantly go back to that because I think the minute we, we, we remove the humanity, the minute we remove the dignity and we say that, you know, uh, right? And with, that, I'll, and, with, and with that, I'll close. No. I, <laughs> but I think that, and I hear what you're saying, that people are going to raise and, and do certain things. <laughs> I'm a business owner, and I have not gone up on my, on my haircuts. I went up, it took me five, almost six years, and I'm saying this because I'm intentional, I was intentional about that. Everybody doesn't have to be greedy. And I think that's some of the things that we, and, and how, how you stop somebody from doing that, I think it comes down to relationships. I think it comes down to, to, to putting the humanity back into whatever it is that we're doing. As you all know, my, my shop is, is on the side of my house. I don't have to. I don't have, my, my rent and my mortgage are one and the same. I pass that cost, sa cost savings on to my customers. I know for a fact that I'm one of the lowest you know, in the area. And I do that intentionally. And I'm saying that to say that for as much as human nature comes into play, I refuse to, to, to lean on that because I think we have, to, we, have to, we have to lean into the, the, the higher portion of who we are. And if that means as a board we take that position and say, okay, we're going to take that higher, higher position of who we are, and I don't know what all that is, but I think to just lay it at the feet of, well, Human nature or greedy. I, I, I don't think that that's. Uh, it, I cringe to think later on in life because I look back in our, in our in our past, in the recent past, and I'm wondering, you know, what are my grandkids going to say? Like, dang, Pat, what were you guys thinking back then? Because I see I see pictures of whenever I was a kid, and I'm like, man, what were they thinking back then? We have an opportunity now to say. Let's look at what we're doing now that's going to affect the future greatly and do the hard thing of whatever that hard thing is. So our grandkids aren't looking at us like, what in the world were you thinking, Pat? And that's my take. And if, and if, it, if it means we have to raise, you know, raise taxes and, and, and appeal to, 
to the, you know whatever business owners or whoever else, our children are worth it. I mean, you're one of the few exceptions, Lance. I know your heart. You got a heart for people, and that. But but we all know a lot with human nature. You know it. You know, and that because, you know, you work with people close every day, you hear them and all that, just like I do, you know, and that. And it'd be wonderful, you know, we could appeal to them, but some are, you know, it's just that human nature, as I say. So should we aim low and forget about the kids? I mean, should we do nothing or should we try to appeal should we sell ourselves? The word marketing came up earlier. We heard from teachers who are like spread so thin and special ed kids who need a, a quality education. We have a lot of needs. Are we gonna like stand back and say, well, good enough? It's not good enough. Until you can tell me that the people that we are trying to help aren't gonna be negatively affected, I, I just can't, their parents are going to be affected. I feel that. You said they're going to raise the rent either way. So it's just, it's right, very, at, it's very. If we do 0%, they're still getting their increase. It's just, it's very challenging for me. I want to make sure that when we're doing this and we're considering this, that yeah, we you want to shoot for the sky. I understand that. And then you could give the kids a good education. But if the parents can't afford to give them groceries because you raised 7%, are we really doing good? You have, yeah, we have the opportunity to give you great education, but you're not eating when you go home because both your parents are working. Now you have this 7% increase. So what's your proposal? How, how, what's the middle, what do you think the middle ground is? Well, I don't know. I'm just, this is just what I'm thinking as we're talking about things. Sometimes in our efforts to want to do the right thing, we don't realize that we're actually just going in a circle. And that's why my question says, that's why my question was, how can we ensure that if we do, like let's say you guys wanna go the full seven, right? How can we ensure that when we do that, we aren't negatively affecting the very people that are already at the 60% of free and reduced and putting such more of a financial strain? Because let's be clear, and I can't give you studies right off the top of my head, you start putting financial strain on families, you wanna talk about mental health problems, you wanna talk about abuse, you wanna talk about all kinds of other issues. So that's where my concern is too. So the very people you're trying to help, are you inadvertently causing them more problem? I don't know what the answer is. I'm just offering a different thought process of where I'm at. How can we figure that out to make sure if we do the 7% increase or six or five or whatever, that we are not inadvertently causing more harm to the very people we think we're trying to help. Well, That's my genuine thought process. Yeah, I, I think, I love your thought process, but there's a whole lot of assumptions in it. We don't know what people are paying for rent. We don't know what their salaries are. We don't know how many kids they have in school. We don't know what kind of increases they got in their rent over the years. We don't know any of that. But what I do know, it's Mr. Bigger's job to sell this, and she, he's been doing a great job. He's gonna tell them, yes, we're raising taxes, but this is what you're gonna get out of it. This is how it's gonna improve the lives of your children. And if they don't get that. But, but I think that Mr. Bigger and the administration have developed this budget, and they must have already considered all of those factors and they have brought to us a budget that with the state funds that we know we'll be getting at least a percentage of, certainly not the full amount that is listed there, but they obviously feel that we're going to have enough plus and with the preparation that he's doing for the um, future and so on. I think we need to wait till he gets that finished and then look at, you know, what, what is coming in the future with, with his 2034 yeah. or whatever um, blueprint that he's preparing. 
I'm happy to wait for <laughs> that time. And if Chris says, I don't need any more money. We got everything covered. We got it handled. And I'll be glad to back down. <laughs> but no one ever has said raise it to 7%. Oh, I just said, oh, yeah. huh? There have been in the past. But well, I, I, I would, I would, I would not mind it being raised to seven percent, honestly, and take it to wherever it needs to be, as far as that's concerned, because we can always come back down. But once we start off at a certain point, we're not able to. Get, we, it's a ceiling. Am I correct? That's like correct. if we say we're, we're just doing three percent, that three percent we get yeah, going higher. Well, that's a great. No, I know, no, that's, I that's a great yeah. setup, Lance. And I appreciate it that uh, I'd asked Tammy for the slide, and she's even one step ahead of me. She put it in front of us, so. You know, as you as you look at the calendar here, the timeline for next steps, right? we have another. We have right, it's our April meeting. We will adopt the proposed budget, and then we will. This is April. Two weeks, two weeks adopt weeks. proposed budget, and then six weeks after that, adopt final budget. Okay, so you know we have until June fourth, but. The discussion that, that I've been hearing the board members talk about, and we can resume this discussion some more when it comes time to vote, is you know, what percentage are you at? Mm -hmm. uh, are we at as a board? And we can, we can kick this can a lot tonight. We have a lot to do here tonight. Uh, I think we need to, you know, resume our discussion. I mean, we could talk about this all night. If you want to talk about it, then I'll just sit here and listen. But uh, a lot of it, I think we've heard everyone's position. I think we've all pretty much stayed in the same position for close to a month now. Uh, yes, Ben. I, I am curious. Uh, I work with folks in poverty. My, I live in a low-income neighborhood. I, I, I'm just curious to know, if we were genuinely concerned about folks that are poor, <laughs> wouldn't we in this budget at least be proactive about addressing our lowest paid employees within the district? Because we actually have power to change that. We have people making 11, 12, $13 an hour that work for this district. If we genuinely concern, were concerned about poor folks, we could at least, like we don't have power to control what Martin's Potato Rolls pays, you know? We have power to determine what price point we start our custodians at, our lunch aides, our, our PCAs, our TAs, right? So I, I hear what you're saying. I think you're making some good points um, and you're asking good questions. Uh, but I think if we really care about that piece, I, I wanna hear us being proactive on that front then, if that's, if that's the reason. And I also say too, like I, I think a lot of this discussion boils down to what do we prioritize? Are we about kids first or taxpayers first? And I sense a responsibility to be about kids first. And I, I, I don't like, I don't like the crowd that says, well, we should just forget about the taxpayers. I disagree. I think we have to be sensitive to the taxpayers um, because of the very questions that you're asking, right? But we. At the end of the day, our responsibility here on this board is a board of education. Our responsibility is kids' education. And uh, for me, I want to see our schools thriving, doing well, well-funded. Um, and many of the concerns that I've raised over the past few years, you've heard me share them. Um, I think they're signs that we're, we're not where we need to be as a district. Okay, let's keep the discussion going. Um, ben, your comments on uh, employee <laughs> compensation and reimbursement, as I said in the beginning. Uh, you know, we, we still have a lot of executive session content. You know, an hour wasn't enough and is not gonna be enough. There's a lot, there's a lot to be done, but. Um, just, just from my view, it's the first time I've heard you discuss and debate the budget, so thank you. Yeah. I mean, this is my first one with you, so I appreciated the conversation and listening. Um, it's helpful for me when I do develop budgets to know where people stand. Even if you're at different places, it's still helpful for me. So um, that was helpful. Um, I would encourage a little more of that conversation because it does give me the guidance I need as the person help de delivering the budget and building the budget. So, so thank you for having the discussion and being open to it. 
on all parties. And I, everyone spoke about the budget. Sherry, did you say anything? Um, Are you the only one that didn't say anything? <laughs> she, she, she started. But she, we, yeah, she started. You started it. So you want to end it, and then we well, can move on. If Sherry's gonna, if Sherry's gonna end it, I'm gonna make one more comment. No, that just... I'm gonna make one more comment, and then you can end it, Sherry. But <laughs> let's be careful with saying that at whatever percent increase the board decides on. Okay. Let's be careful of saying whether that number's two, three, four, five, six, or seven. I don't care where it is. No one here is saying that number is because we're not for the kids. And let's let's try to take that out of the battle. I, I didn't I, hear I, anyone I, say I, that either. Because I don't think that's anyone's thought or intent or mindset as they're voting for whatever number that's going to be. I, I don't. I don't think I heard that. From anyone. Well, I, I heard that. I, I felt that. Yeah. I did. I did feel that. Uh, to me, it's about because priorities. Because it's not about. It's not about putting money towards kids. It's a. <laughs> that's part of it. But you know, mm. I. I have this hard thing on the board sometimes where if we don't go a certain direction, then you don't care about kids. I really care. We, I believe this whole board really cares about kids, and I don't believe it should be tied to a number on the budget. Um, I don't I, think anyone said that. Anyone on this board doesn't care about kids, I think. Well, that's not what I heard, but anyway. Okay, so so anyway, you know, over the, since I've been on the board, you know, I've been chastised because I didn't go to a full amount on, on, the, on the budget, but I think there has to be a balance, and I look for a balance. I look for, I'm looking for a balance for the taxpayer, you know, and what they, what they have to do, and then I'm looking at a balance of, of, of what we need for the kids. There are so many needs that we do have, but I also have to balance that with the taxpayers. And you know, you hear you hear comments out in the community all the time. I hear about, you know, from the from the teachers to the to the to the uh, you know, property owner. Uh, when I was campaigning, I got all kinds of comments, you know. And so I have to, I I try to find a balance. But you know, That's going good. going to the max I will probably never go to the max because I want to be respectful to both groups. And so I'm probably going to hit the middle of the road. And that's just where I stand and that's who I am. But my care, my love for kids and care for kids is, is very, very important. And the fact that our administration is really going after some heavy duty grants, money's coming in. I also believe that we need to switch it, change it and rearrange it where our monies go. And sometimes I don't think our monies go exactly where they need to go, but that's not my choice that'll be the superintendent's choice but I think all that needs to be analyzed and I know we try to do that each year but in some cases it's not done because I've I've noticed it you know a position that was there for the last 10 years do we need that position uh, you know what what do we need or what don't we need so switch it change it rearrange it and, and that's what we do on our household budgets and I think that's what we need to do as a district too so that is a charge that I'm hoping our, our superintendent is already looking at just like we talked transportation we could save a lot with the student transportation when we do the outside placements if we did things differently we have to be looking at that constantly and adjusting the budget and adjusting what we do in a school district so i didn't say much i was really good i sat back and didn't say much we knew you had something and, and now i just decided i'm gonna let this roll out because i know i know where i am on it and i'm trying to balance it it's not i don't want to hurt either group so it's a balancing act and i you know it's good sure that's all I have to say. That's good, Chair. Okay. Chief Thanks. Carter. We're still on three. No. Uh, brief, Chief. <laughs> well, I know safety's always bottom of the list. Uh, we, we do, we do five-minute speeches in safety from now on. So, um, real, real quick, I'm just going to go over some of the purchases we made with uh, with some ESSERS funding and some and some grant funding and some things that we have in the works. Some things that we've already uh, spent money on through ESSERS, uh, through the school district, through some studying we've done, and, and different things that we've talked about. Um, some holes that we needed to fill in the district as far as safety and security. Uh, and we tried to touch a lot of different areas. So what you're going to see is a list of things that we've actually purchased or are in the process of purchasing. 
um, counseling and trauma response, postvention kits, um, surveillance cameras. Uh, between Caches, Cams North, Cam South, and all of our elementary schools, we have about 240 uh, new cameras that are going in throughout the district. Uh, we take a holistic approach to safety and security. It's just not one or two schools. Um, SAGE technology, what that does is that is the, uh, the all-call systems in our schools, our phone systems, uh, PA systems inside and outside so that we can get announcements for our drills and any safety concerns we would have. We added 340 radios, portable radios, and that's across all schools in the district. Uh, classroom go kits, we added about 150 to what we already had. So just about every elementary classroom has a go kit. Uh, we have um, numerous go kits in our middle schools. Uh, CMS just got some this week, and then the high school also has some. Chief, um, what's, that, what's a go kit? Specific? So a go kit consists of a lot of different things. If you have to leave your classroom and go outside or go to an area for an extended period of time, there might be trash bags. There might be some small containers of water, glow oh, sticks, yeah. uh, just different the things. Right? The it's the backpack, backpack. that's right. correct. And then it'll have class lists in it and just everything they would need if they would have to go off site. Yep. Um, medical kits, um, tourniquets, so there's a lot of different things in those kits. Uh, the school pass, student pass system we used at Caches, um, that was instituted this year. Um, between us and technology, we're looking at going um, maybe to another system uh, other than school pass, but we needed to maybe control some of the um, student activity in the school, so that has helped Caches do that. Next slide, please. Uh, FOB access control readers, and what that is is, is the actual FOB swipes. So we found a lot of schools that have some doors that uh, are always being accessed that they couldn't get back in unless they had a key or they had to go around a building to another area. So we're trying to get some more access control. The goal would be to get those in, on every exterior door for every school. Uh, nurses training and equipment. So all of our nurses in the district got uh, two day or a uh, two day training for tactical emergency medicine. We bought seven port 17 portable AEDs. We also bought all of the uh, schools a BLS nurses kit that has uh, medical supplies in it. So we're also looking at upgrading the athletic facility uh, and safety security signage um, uh, in and around our areas. There's a large 3M uh, window film project that's gonna touch on to all of our schools. Um, and then we're looking at a couple servers because of our uh, the old uh, servers that, that house our uh, video footage on it, so we're looking at a couple purchases with that. Next slide, please. Okay, PCC grant funding. So right now, all of our schools have gotten additional LED lighting in the parking areas and on the wall packs around our buildings. We're, we just got approved for playground fencing, so most of our elementary schools are gonna get some additional fencing to border off some areas to make the kids safer. Uh, we did get awarded a $45,000 PCCD meritorious grant which we put into surveillance cameras uh, and doing those installations at various schools. And the last one I'll touch on is the PCCD competitive grant. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of $300,000. And we're looking at a Cassius Stadium uh, and Cassius project with that because our, our stadium is actually a reunification point and also an evacuation point for the borough of Chambersburg. So we're looking at whole stadium lights emergency lighting packs on the uh, in and around the interior of the stadium, some exterior fencing that's gonna go around the entire complex, gates uh, and access points, and then also a new sound system to tie in uh, if we ever have to do reunify. So we just have some grants that we have, um, the first two there, and then we have a grant that we've applied for. Hopefully we can get that, uh, that information sooner than later and be awarded that grant. So that's all I wanted to touch on tonight. Just wanted to give you, hey, this is where we're at, this is what we've got, and uh, you know, safety and security, we're moving in a good direction. Um, I won't touch on that slide right now. Dave, you can turn my presentation off, thank you. Yes. Andrew Buchanan, are you, are you putting uh, the fencing there as well? So we are. So every, just about every other one of the elementary schools, and I wanna say it's all of them, are getting some type of chain link fencing. So Andrew Buchanan, we're not fencing in four sides of every playground. Yeah. Well, but, I noticed their playground when we when we did our building tour that they didn't have fencing there, and I was like, how are they playing kickball and so forth with those streets without having the fencing? So that would be that would be. Yeah, great. it's mainly going to be around the playground equipment initially, yeah, so they can play kickball, and then we're going to build out from there. Yes, ma'am. Road. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm assuming that uh, the nurses training they're also trained with uh, Narcan, so what opioid, you know. So we do have access to Narcan in all of our schools, yes. Yeah, thank you. 
Anything else? Well, I know you didn't uh, look at that slide on the incidents, but I'm pleased to see that there's decreases in many of the areas. Well, those numbers aren't quite the complete, complete yet, but yes, we're doing a better job of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I realize we're not they, through they the are. full school. They, they are, and I, I think it's... Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to have some really bad things happen to get them... Well, Gary, Gary Carter added those all up by hand, so those numbers might be a little... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, so we're, looking, we're, we're hoping... Good. Each year, we're, we hope they go down, and I think with some things that we have going on and with the vision, I, I think the next couple of years, you're going to see some great things occur, so... Thanks for doing all those grants. Thank you. We're trying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to apologize for Mrs. Oh, Engel. Oh, okay, you're getting ready, sir. <laughs> it seems like after every presentation, five people leave. And we're down to like <laughs> two people left, and it's Melissa. And then like, oh, yeah. oh, Melissa. <laughs> you're still here, though. <laughs> And I want to thank Melissa and all the, the librarians. So I want to give a little history lesson, since we have some new board members here, of what uh, a policy that was worked on. Um, so our in the fall, early fall, when we were over at Cash's, we had uh, some community members that came up with some concerns about some uh, materials and resources and books in our libraries and uh, we were charged, uh, Dr. Schur at the time charged the policy committee to take a look at policy 109, uh, which we had a couple meetings and the last meeting that we had, uh, we had Susan Barrier and Melissa Angle Unruh, who's with us tonight, come and talk to the uh, board about their interpretation of the policy and also what they do uh, when we have some resources that are challenged. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I think it was uh, a really, it was a great meeting that um, Melissa and Susan spoke eloquently at. Um, I believe Ms. Gogler was there uh, and Mr. Haydock wasn't on the board yet, but you were there and Mr. McKee was there as well. I don't know if any, missing anyone, but uh, she did an awesome job and at the end, they charged the librarians uh, to get together on the February um, work day, the PD day, and they did that. And there's some changes that you see in the, uh, Dave, if you'd go to 5.05, we're talking about it now, but you're gonna, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, whether to put it on the consent agenda. Dave Kirkpatrick. Oh, Dave Kirkpatrick's behind the wall. <laughs> I didn't realize the chair. It's magic. <laughs> the guy in the chair. The guy in the chair. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you would open up the... Uh, <laughs> the Wizard. Draft, draft policy, please. <laughs> Dave, you got my good appearance now? And if, <laughs> if you could scroll down, they, they <laughs> made... <laughs> We need a little co comedic relief. <laughs> the uh, so, but Dave, if, if uh, you would scroll down, some of the changes are um, made in purple, I believe. If what it was on at least my, my when I'm taking a look, uh, so you may have the the wrong. Yes, there it is the parent section. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Melissa and she's going to talk about what they did. A lot of the changes are in the AR. The board approves, just for knowledge, the board approves the policy. Um, the AR we're making changes to, but we did include that tonight. And I'm going to have Melissa talk a little bit. The um, policy itself, we didn't alter too much because um, we felt that it was a strong policy. When I was a student at Mansfield University, um, our policy for the Chambersburg District was one that was held up as an exemplar. And it does adhere to the Library Bill of Rights, which is um, a document that was created by the American Library Association. And a lot of the components that you see, those numbered components, attest to uh, the selection process that school personnel will follow when selecting resources for our school libraries. And so we felt that our current policy really hit all of those main tenants. But what we heard um, through that meeting um, when we had concerned parents speaking and when we met um, with the policy committee was that while we are upholding 
all of those tenants to support our wider community, um, we realize that every community will have a range of attitudes and um, they will have different ideas about what is appropriate for their own families. And we wanted to honor that in a formal way um, because we cannot assume that all members of the community are going to hold the same values. Um, and we wanted to give families the opportunity to, um, I guess, have a very formal process to perhaps limit their own families from what uh, they might deem inappropriate with their family values. So what you see in purple is what we've added. And we've noticed a lot of districts are beginning to add these opt-out forms as part of their policies. Um, and I believe Dr. Bigger had experience with that in his Did former district as well. Thank you for the promotion, that's Mr. <laughs> oh, well, sorry. So thank you. Well, <laughs> I've just given you a promotion, that's awesome. No, 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 no. Where's your money <laughs> But yeah, we went through the same thing. And we do think the opt-out form is super important because um, we value parental rights. We definitely support parents who want more of a voice regarding what their children are reading. Um, we do recognize that while it's our job as professionals to purchase resources for the district as a whole, for the community as a whole, and we have a community with a wide range of um, values and belief systems, we do want to give parents that opportunity to voice their concerns. So the opt-out form that we've created is going to give families that chance to restrict their students from specific library books. We modeled our opt-out form from districts such as Gettysburg, Elizabethtown, and even Sheraton County in Wyoming, I believe. We really liked a lot of the information that we saw there. So the policy itself, we simply added what you see in purple, and that is stating that our district respects the rights of parents and guardians to direct the upbringing of their own children, including the right to make certain decisions regarding their children's education. So we are offering that opt-out form. And that's pretty much the change that we've made in the policy itself. Um, and then it was my understanding that the opt-out form itself is part of the AR. Yeah, that, that may be the other attachment there. Uh, Man behind the curtain. Mr. Hawes. <laughs> 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 scroll to the bottom and there's a link at the bottom. Yeah. I think you just opened the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this is the administrative regulation that we had in the past. Um, what you see in purple, we are adding. So we added the language of opting out to the AR. Um, and then we added uh, some specifics if you scroll down just a little bit more. Um, yep, uh, so in addition to adding that opt-out information, when we looked at other districts' policies and their opt-out forms, um, we noticed that many of them had specific language regarding the process that they would follow if a parent decides the opt-out form isn't enough and they would like to formally challenge a book. The AR that we've had in the past clearly outlined that process that we would follow but we added in purple some components that we've noticed in other districts, uh, I think that would streamline the process if we were to get flooded with requests for challenges. Um, and so we decided to add that we would consider one formal challenge at a time and that each challenge would be handled in the order in which they were received. Um, if a library material goes through the formal challenge process and the decision is made to retain that material, that same material may not be formally challenged again um, for at least five years after its initial challenge. And those were some tenants we were seeing over and over again in other policies, um, especially in districts that were getting flooded with requests for challenges. Um, so we added that in purple. And then if you scroll down a little bit more, all of the steps that you see we've had um, we tweaked the wording in step four just a little bit because we've had some changes. Um, so we've stressed that the committee would need to read the question material as well as professional authoritative reviews of the material. The passages should not be taken out of context and it should be evaluated as a whole. 
The material should be reviewed thoroughly in light of the selection policy and the community at large, and the complainant may make a presentation. So we kept some of the same ideas. We just reworded it a little differently, and then we made some changes. The former AR said that part of the committee that would be formed if a book is formally challenged would include the supervisor of library science and the language arts coordinator, and we no longer have either of those positions. So we removed those and added the director of curriculum and instruction instead. And then I noticed there was something unnecessarily repeated from step six mm -hmm. and step seven. It was phrased twice. I just mm -hmm. didn't think we needed that. So those were the changes that we made to the AR. We did spend a lot of time um, creating the opt-out form, and I don't know if we have that to show or if that's even something we would show at this time. Mr. Widman, did you submit the, the form that we actually created to be part of this? Yeah, they, they have a spot attached. Okay, it's not yet. Yeah. Okay, but it would be. So we created the actual form, the opt-out form. We would have a Google form that parents would um, fill out um, listing the name of the student, um, the school, and titles that they would like to have um, the students restricted access to. And then we would put that note into our circulation system. So if a student comes into the library and um, checks out a book, we'll see a list of books that the student may not check out. But we have created that form. We've created an instruction form for it. And I think we're ready to go. And that form will be found where? Um, right now, we have it stated in the instructions that we would put it on the library services website and we would have it in the main office of each building in the district. Should that be attached to the AR? Can mm -hmm. that be put in the handbooks too as well? Student handbooks. The only thing that I was thinking is, is five years um, before somebody can come in and talk about this, um, is that too long maybe? I, I was We're years. open to discussion. We were just looking at what two other years, districts three years. were saying. I mean, you don't want to keep ha rehashing it, but five years seems like a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm getting punchy. All I could think of was dress code. We changed the dress code here pretty quickly after we fixed it. <laughs> I know. So I think it sets bad policy if you do things too quickly. I mean, I, 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 I think from my view, the, the five is a good time for a board to change and maybe have another look mm -hmm. at it um, versus the same board arguing over it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that five years is just for a particular that book. book. That book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I get real sensitive to abrupt policy changes as a person that deals with state and federal laws mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't like abruptness, you know, so if it was less than that, I'd be worried. If, this book, yes. Next year, no. This book, yes. So mm -hmm. you could volleyball yeah. okay. around that a lot. That would be hard for us that makes sense. to respond with community. Yeah, that makes sense. I just was trying to figure that out in my mind. Mm -hmm. So, Melissa, this in no way prevents a student from coming into the library, going to the stacks, seeing a book they like, pulling it down and reading it right there. Mm -hmm. They just can't check it out if they're on the opt-out. Deal. Yes, in our instruction sheet that we've created, we have a bulleted list of items for the parent to consider, and Mike, that is actually one of them, that um, it does not restrict the student from entering the library. It does not mean that the student's not going to hear about the book from other students right. or see other students reading it. We tried to cover our bases in that instruction sheet, um, but it will prohibit them from checking it out. I, I did attend the meeting way back when, and from the presentation you and Susan gave, um, I knew we were in good hands, you were doing it professionally, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Thank you. Um, should we add those other documents as part of the AR at some I point? The, we'll have that for the first reading. formal meeting in sure. the first read. So it has to go through first read. And Different reads. Well, we have them ready. When you're ready, they're ready. I'll get them. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for staying. Okay. Um, we're going to do the item four. These are all. These will all be consent agenda items. Um, 
going to do just a series of two quick questions here for both um, Chris and, and his cabinet and any board member. Are there any items on here that anyone would like more additional information for on this evening? Uh, is the first question. Or are there any items where the admin wanted to maybe add addi some additional information on? 4.04 .04 is going to be pulled until June board meeting. Okay. And Dr. Long is always a step ahead of me. Thank you. Is, are there any items on here that we don't want to put forward to the consent agenda? Keeping in mind in two weeks when we meet, these items, they won't be discussion items. So if there's anything you want to discuss, you know, we'll uh, we'll stay here as long as we have to tonight. Yes, Ben. 4.02. I mm -hmm. think there's an extra zero on the cost. Six thousand something. Yes, there is. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Yep. Four, four point zero five. Six point five million. First start <laughs> partnership. Can you highlight that for a minute? What was the question? 4.05, 4. 4. First Start Partnership. Yes, that is uh, First Start Partnership. They're located, they have two locations here in Chambersburg, one on Stanley Avenue. This is basically uh, what used to be Head Start before, so pre-K students. It's federally funded. It's a pass-through through our district, um, but it's an MOU, and these are the supports that we work with them on at First Start. They're also out at the new... Uh, what used to be Lincoln Lanes. Right. Do we have any of those uh, currently in our buildings? I know we didn't have as many this past year as what we previously had because because I, of no, we, space. The, because they, they built the space out there, they were fully able to be there. So we actually got the space back. We had several at Ben Chambers. We had at right, uh, uh, Buchanan. Yeah, we had them at three different locations. So and, they're no longer in the district that's physically. That's correct. Okay, yep. that, that frees up some space for us, mm -hmm. for the district. That's all. Right. Um, 4.10, Costa Rica, unique field trip. Just in case there's some questions on that. Sure, I was going to ask if you wanted to talk about that. Uh, this is through Ashley Osherman. She's one of our Spanish teachers. Um, she has been doing this trip in the past, 2010, 2012, 2015. Um, the students go over to Costa Rica and they are fully immersed. They stay with families that are um, Spanish speaking. And then they go to the school um, each day of the week for four to five hours. Um, and then um, they're, they're taught completely in Spanish. So these are um, advanced placement students um, in the AP class. And she, she told me that um, through the past, she actually looked at their AP scores. They scored much higher since they had this immersion um, program than the others did during those three years that she went. Um, she had a baby and decided to stay home since 2015, but, um, and then COVID hit. But she would like to do this again. She's looking at either 25 or 26, the school or the school year is 25 or 26 based off of student sign up. Um, it's getting pretty tight right now for 2025 um, because I believe they have to have everything submitted by the end of April um, to the company as far as how many students they have. So it, it could turn into a 2026 trip for planning purposes. I would just like to comment on the 4.08, the early graduation request. I am so pleased to see five students from Cassius that are doing the um, <clears throat> early graduation. I'm questioning how much communication to parents and how soon are we communicating that potential to do that? I was talking to a parent recently who um, did not know that it was possible, and it seems as though it's something that as early as late middle school, parents and students should have some 
uh, communication of that potential of taking courses that would lead to the advanced completion of high school. There was such a good article in the um, um, PSBA uh, school director update from April 3rd. If you haven't read that, it was about an IEP student that uh, talked about her experience in doing this and so on. And I, I just think we need to be promoting that with the more mature students. It's certainly a select group. Uh, not every student is likely to be eligible for it, but I, I just don't know whether there's adequate communication of that possibility. And I'd like to commend this Ms. Mummert for uh, the counselor. I assume that she probably is responsible for uh, yeah, promoting it. Yeah, she's one of the two 11th grade counselors. Um, I have a meeting next week with Lindsay Leonard, who's our head counselor. She's a senior counselor this year, but I'll talk to her about uh, you know how they promote it and and to promote it more. So, uh, is the okay. item on the shed? Is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Two thirds contributions from boosters, one third out of athletic budget. Well, out of the well spanned donation well -span fund. fund, yes. Any other questions on consent items? Uh, yes, sir. The unique field trip to Costa Rica, love that we are offering, that we have a teacher taking the lead on this. I spoke highly of the group that went to Germany this past summer. Um, so I'm all about it. I'm, I am curious to know the price point's high. Uh, is there anything we can do to offer scholarships for students that where the, the finances might be a barrier? Is that what, what are various approaches that we've taken over the years that could potentially work, or is that just not something we can do? I'll have to check with Mrs. Osherman um, concerning that, but usually it's fundraising or, or so they are doing fundraising yeah. for yeah. it. They're doing oh, that's fundraising. Cool. That would okay, be a good reason to delay it a year. Usually they do multiple years Correct. out to fundraise, not just okay. one year. Great. Good. The reason why she put 25 on here was just in case she had students that were able to go. Um, I highly doubt that 25 is going to be in the picture. But she needs to make sure she starts planning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, comments on consent agenda items? That's good. Okay. Going to group five, going to uh, take these five into three groups 5.01, 5.02. Uh, Mr. Whitman. Okay, 5.01 is our yellow breaches. This is our, uh, we have 19 spots plus one incentive spot, spot at uh, yellow breaches. This is a placement for our special ed students um, that need a lot of extra support that uh, we cannot provide. Um, it's an increase this year from last year of $22,235. And Five point oh two is uh, two students um, for Hoffman Homes. Typically, students that uh, need to go to Hoffman Homes have some so social, emotional, some mental health issues uh, that's a detriment to their learning in a public school setting, and they need a lot more supports on that side. Um, and so, we have two students that are going to be heading there. Any questions? Additional information, 5.01 and 5.02. Well, just have you, have you heard what classes they're going to be adding at the Franklin Learning Center? Would any of these students, I mean, do we know the, what classes they're going to add? Um, well, what we're looking at are some behavior classrooms there. Um, you know, Hoffman Homes is more for the sure. mental health side. We weren't looking at that for there. Right now, more behavior and more autistic support classes that we're looking for uh, uh, help with that's closer to home and not, not up in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? 5.01, 5.02. Okay, next two, if there's any questions, we can't do it here. We have to go to executive session or we do it before the April 23rd. So there's just two, uh, two one-year expulsions. Uh, 
for one CMS student and one CAMS North student. If you have any questions, we'll talk about them. There, there is going to be another one that will be on, so it will end up being a third, just wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's happening right now. Um, so. And, and let them know that there might be a judicial committee. We have to pull yeah, the, uh, there may be a um, need for a judicial committee. We have a meeting that's going to be coming up next week. Um, Which will be an all call for three board members. Yes. So, so okay. see how that goes. Item 505, we had the presentation on that earlier. Uh, I think we had questions, so that one will move forward. For the first read. For the first read. Finance and facilities, item 601, budget transfer, additional transportation costs. Mrs. Stauffer. Yeah, so um, as it was presented to uh, the board through the Friday report, we have seen an increase in transportation. Um, Mr. Kirkpatrick is here, as well as uh, Ms. Stein, if there's any specific questions. Uh, we're estimating a need of an additional $455,000 that we would need to move from the reserve to the transportation accounts. And again, primarily due to uh, increased numbers, distance, and just a whole lot of those, those variables in our homeless population and our special needs students. Questions, comments? Okay, 6.02, disposal of district property. Yeah, I'm actually gonna let Mrs. Stein speak to this one. Uh, normally you see this in an information item, but we do have an action that we're requesting of the board for this one bus. Um, yes, so we have a bus 416. It's a 2004 72 passenger bus, and it just so happens that it needs a new engine. Um, at the estimated cost of about $30,000. So due to the age of the bus, we're not recommending that we spend that money to replace the engine. But we did receive a donation request for that bus from the Franklin County Public Safety Training Center. Um, and we think that would be an awesome you know, mm -hmm. community thing for us mm -hmm. to donate the bus. It would cost Basically, the district would be losing the, about $1,300 that we would get for scrap. So um, that's what we're requesting, that we move this to the board to approve the donation of us. And correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby, we also don't have to pay to have it towed to scrap if we donate it. They will come pick it up. So correct. we'll save on that cost as well. Yes. Questions? CMS budget transfer. This is for uh, Mr. Stinger to be able to replace the library furniture that was originally put in there when the building was built. Um, the furniture is wooden and uh, with student use it is falling apart and Buildings and Grounds has been out multiple times trying to fix it. So uh, we're pulling from the 1100 the educational side um, to the 2380 for the principal side in order for him to purchase the, the replacement furniture. Questions? 7.01, uh, Chief Carter gave his report earlier. Uh, nothing going forward on nope. April 23rd nope. meeting for that. That's information only. Uh, privilege of the floor. Mrs. Dalloway. Any items <laughs> on the floor? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> You received the attendance medal this evening. I'm only here because Leslie would kill me if I left. We won't tell her. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a question about that. Yes, sir. There was a time where we were doing, at the regular board meeting, we were doing before and after, and then this is just after. Is there any reason we can't just do before and after? at both meetings. I mean, it may take a little bit extra time, but if people have stuff they want to talk about that pertains to the agenda, I want to hear it. And then there's stuff that, and, and I, I want, personally, I want that at both meetings. Um, you, I know we don't vote at this meeting. Yeah, you can blame me for that, just coming in new no, policy, so it was really the most efficient way. Yeah. It's up to the board if they want to make the change. My, people are here and they want to, that's where I'm at, so. We still have well, maybe even on a night like tonight, Well, that's one of my concerns with not having a front end. Does that make sense or, or not? I don't know. 
I just feel like if you're going to do public comment, especially in a meeting like this, what are the chances of somebody saying when it goes two, three hours to actually, if they have a public comment, to say anything? So, so but, just I'll give you like yeah. so my intention. Context, my intention please. in the context was. Uh, usually the public that's more informed from the discussion has a different question at the end of the meeting than they would at the beginning gotcha. being less informed mm -hmm. yeah. and then they also are a little different when it comes to the voting meeting it's only agenda items right. okay. this is everything so okay. that was the rationale yeah. that has worked in general mm -hmm. to calm the waters before and otherwise you just have a line of people that just yeah. speak and then you talk about it like oh it wasn't what I thought I'm not trying to restrict anybody from talking no. but that was the no, logic that makes, yeah. that makes sense and and the other part I think to add to that is what I call the the rinse and repeat and as a board I think we all should, can be commended for you know we we have a lengthy or a, more, a lengthy discussion at committee of the whole and then we don't rehash every topic exactly. same discussion at the mm -hmm. second meeting and so with agenda then all right the public a lot of times does the same thing. You would hear it at Committee of the Whole, and then in two weeks, we would hear it again. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, similar to exactly what Mr. Bigger just said, you know, let's, let's provide them information, and then if they still have questions, mm -hmm. they, you know, they can do it anytime uh, after this meeting and before the action meeting. Because, again, the, the overall theory is we're not taking any action tonight. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And likewise, they have the opportunity to contact board members individually. Mm -hmm. Our phone numbers are on the website. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had people call me about things, and you look into it, mm -hmm. you refer them to the right person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's adequate the way it is. So is it, is and it three total between the two? Is that the current? Two. Yeah, it's two. It's one at the end of this meeting and one before the votes at the next one. We're required yeah. to have the one before the votes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, that's, talked, I think Chris, that's adequate. Chris Fay and I spoke about this Friday in our in our weekly conversation, uh, and so I appreciate you bringing it up, Ben. And we need to clean up our AR a our little policy, bit yeah. policy on this because it it does not conflicting. It conflicts with yeah. policy, so I'm glad you brought it up. You know, we're lo we the three of us were talking about you know revising the policy so it aligns with that. So is that with Chris's explanation of what we've talked about tonight, is the board okay with the administration proceeding with that policy change, or do we not want to change it? So the only thing I don't like about that, right? That so that's two per month, two hour days. The only thing I don't like about that is if somebody comes to the board meeting and they have they want to talk about something that's not on the agenda then there's no place for that. And then sometimes you get people saying, well, this fits under seven point. Sure, a stretch, you know, it's a stretch. Well, it really doesn't, but. So your suggestion is to change the voting meeting to agenda and not agenda, is your yeah, suggestion. Yeah, typically at the end, you're not, you don't have a lot of people anyways. Yeah. So. Well, that's at the beginning. Oh, during the vote, it's before the meeting. At the end, this one does say agenda and not agenda. And then the gotcha. one on the voting meeting only says agenda items because we're voting that night. Yeah, so, can we do non-agenda items at the end, or or am I don't know? Enough? I, and this is not a game. I mean, yeah. I mean, I could just bring policy 903 for the change, and then you can debate it then one more time. Give sure. you a chance to think let's, about it. Let's do yeah, 903 as yeah. a discussion item at next next cow. Yeah, and, and we can go from there. Yeah. I'll be fine either way. Yeah, yeah. But we'll no, it needs change anyway, so we'll bring it. Well, um, yeah, it was kind of piggyback. It's not the same thing. It's a little different. Um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. One, one more thing. Let's we do have one more around. thing then. Uh, okay. The public forum was also another opportunity for me to engage with the public around the agenda mm -hmm. items too. So that's that was the I forgot that was the whole reason I did the public forum. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Lance. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. That's uh, been good. Um, before we are you talking about that or do you have another item it's it's along that lines as far as the public comment or public view okay go, go ahead go so ahead it's uh, um the the, the um because we're not online as far as video we're just mm -hmm. audio right? we are yeah. right we're still on audio correct yeah. i didn't know if we were going or we're going back to the video to youtube uh as it is right now we're at audio that'd be a board decision if we wanted to go back to video okay yeah. i'd like to see that but yeah like to be on camera? Well, I, yeah. 
I got a good side. No. So, so we'll add that. We'll add that as a discussion item also for the next cow, and then we can discuss it more. Thank you. Thank Before we get too far, <laughs> we are on item ten, and uh, for new business discussion only. You know, this is what um, again part of our new approach, uh, Chris's <laughs> ideas, and and then the board's ideas, but. This is what I've talked about. It's a minimum of a three-step process where, you know, at this, you know, anybody, any board member. Basketball games or what happens? <laughs> Soccer fields. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so so uh, my thought was this, and only because I've talked to too many students and too many parents who have told me, my kid got to middle school and it was a train wreck. They were anxious, and I knew these were good people, good parents, they had good kids, and the kids were going to cyber schools because they couldn't handle it. So my thought is this. If you had opportunities to bring elementary schools together, however many we have in the early grades, just a time or two a year, as they progressed in the higher grades, fourth, fifth grade, a little more often, and you start to give them an opportunity to see people that are different from them, that don't look like them, that sound different, accents. Then when they get to middle school, it's not this shock. They're in a, I've heard people say, I, my kid got to the classroom, the home room, and they, they didn't know one person from their elementary experience in that classroom. So I say, these kids that are like going through these turmoils, it's real. I'm not gonna judge a child why they're incapable of dealing with this situation, it's just simply a fact, they are. So how do we help them? But what I'll say now is simply this, if this doesn't make any sense in terms of reducing behavioral problems when they get to the higher grades, bullying, fighting, lots of problems, I need the administrative staff here to tell me, Mike, this is a stupid idea, let's just drop it. I'm happy to do that. I'll find another idea. <laughs> but right now, I'm thinking you all know there's some value in this because you've got to deal with the aftermath of these kids showing up, 
getting all bent out of shape, and then now you're losing them to cyber schools or home schools because they can't handle it. So I'm saying, can't this be part of your big plan? Yeah, I think um, um, our internal discussions have certainly moved us internally way uh, further than the board and the public right now about what a reconfiguration of grade levels might look like. You heard that tonight for the first time. Yes, yes. Um, so yes, we are, I think your thought and idea would be best channeled into the idea of do we have a four or five school where all kids come together in fourth grade. Right. So I think my suggestion would be come to the options in October. If one of those options is to combine students earlier all at one grade level, that would be your all in moment to say, is the rest of the board with me on that? Because that's the best strategy. Mm -hmm. All other yes. things we do would be mm -hmm. touching around the edges Definitely. to try to make what putting all students in fifth grade in one building would do eloquently as you described it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, and I'm happy with that. Thank you. But I'd be interested in hearing what any other board members think about the whole idea. Uh, I like I like what uh, Ms. Ms. Gogler said the last time about finding some of the other civic uh, 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 community, entities. Community yeah. organizations. Yeah, and, and, and getting them to maybe couple with, with you know, with the school and admin and whatever else to, well, I don't know what that would look like, but I think no, I say the more the merrier. If we can make the community and the school a little more closely knit, that'd be great. I, I really think that the reconfiguration of the grades is going to make a major difference if that is the direction that we choose to go. I don't know that that's the direction that either Mr. Bigger and his team will suggest with the consultants and so on, but. We're pretty confident it'll be an option. <clears throat> but <laughs> it, it, it just has, option it one. has amazed me having <laughs> lived one. through the <laughs> rivalry <laughs> between yeah. Central and yeah. Faust Junior Highs, why we ever had a two middle school concept whenever it was that that happened. There must have been a reason, but, um, it just, you don't learn from history many times and you repeat it. And for many years, that central Faust issue was just what you're talking about now. And we have it in middle school now instead of junior high. So I'm hopeful that we can see mm -hmm. the way to get our classes all together somehow. Because I think it's going to help. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. I, Mr. Widman and myself, we were the last of that. The, our class was the last eighth graders to be separated with and Central. It, and I was the first. <laughs> <laughs> so you all turned out fine. Come on. <laughs> Sherry, you had a well, comment? All I wanted to say is I think a, the grade configuration could really solve a lot of what you're, you're saying because I know there is anxiety. Um, and I, I sat and watched both board meetings that I missed and I, I heard your thoughts and you know I understand where you're coming from. So I think that that would really help. And also I was thinking today perhaps you know, looking at both middle schools and what do we do for orientation. And I think there's probably some things already in place, but you know, a tour of the school, uh, but at the end of the school, I don't know, I guess you'd probably do that, but yeah. there's probably some things already, but sometimes parents forget if there's an open house in the summer and don't take their kid and then their child, you know, doesn't know what to do on the first day. So do we have an orientation at the end of school so that they can tour the middle school? Okay, so that's a convoluted story, but we did. And then when we went to two middle schools, it was difficult because we had kids from different schools Sending. going to different buildings. So they started doing it after they knew who was going where, they would send out the information to it over the summer. But um, we are, we have met, uh, we've met with the PAG group, the parent advisory group. Today. Say again? Today, the middle school met with the parent advisory group today. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking at bringing that back because we can yeah, figure I think, that out. I think that would take away a lot of the anxiety of going into the school because it's just not that there's not a kid in the class that you know. It's just knowing where to go and you can relieve a lot of that anxiety. If we can do it before the end of the school year, that would be great, even if there's changes that have to be made. Other board members, thoughts, comments on this discussion item? 
If I can summarize it uh, accurately, thank you. I would have forgot that again. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Baker. But so I think, I think the where we are on this item is it's a timing thing. Uh, give the administration some time, see what comes out of all this work, heavy heavy lifting we have to do, uh, and then uh, we can revisit it uh, as we as we work through the, during that process and then revisit it once uh, once we start into action on it. Yes, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay. The one announcement, uh, next meeting, our April meeting, we are over in the library due to primary election here. So the April 23rd meeting, we will be in the library classroom. Does it say library classroom or auditorium? Auditorium. Oh, it says Cassius Library Cassius. Classroom. It says Cassius Library Classroom. Library classroom. Uh, where are we? Okay. Yeah. Where are we at? For the board meeting? Mm -hmm. Will there be yeah. room for? Yeah. I mean, we're. Is there going to be room for Patty? <laughs> 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 I'm going to be working at school. Is Mr. Oz oh. coming? <laughs> it's better than the auditorium. The auditorium's way too intimidating. Oh. It is, and the echo. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing no, in budget fun. discussion yeah, is that there more people. We'll out. see. We'll find out. All right. We can always move down there. Yeah. We'll have a backup plan if we end up with a full house. <laughs> the rest of the library. The rest of the library. Uh, That's why yeah. Yeah. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good meeting tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you.